and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, everyone? And welcome to Bridgestone Arena and a game day edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk live on location in Nashville, Tennessee before tonight's big game in the Central Division between the Jets and the Nashville Predators. Uh, you might be seeing it looks a little dark here. Shout out to Remus, the CTO, for telling me, well, first of all, for getting a travel light to stick on the computer. The press area of Bridgestone is kind of in the upper bowl, basically. It's a just a converted area where there are seats. But I can confirm, although it looks like I'm potentially in a closet, here is the rink where tonight's uh, tilt will be happening between the Jets and the Nashville Predators. Jets can uh, clinch third place tonight um, to uh, avoid any possibility of the Preds catching them with a win. And we're going to talk a lot about this central division. Preds, Jets, Max Herz is going to join us, who uh, usually jumps on with us when the Jets are playing Nashville. He's here getting ready for the game and his broadcast tonight. And then an individual I enjoyed some time with last night here in Nashville. One, Ken Weeb with the Winnipeg Free Press. Kenny finishing up uh, his newsletter and duties after the morning skate today. He'll join us a little later on. We will have some non-Jets talk later on in the program. Winnipeg is hosting the CEBL Championship Weekend coming up next year in 2025. The commissioner of the league Mike Morreale is going to jump on with us. And then we cannot have Masters Week without a visit from Jeff Feinberg. Feinberg coming on just before 3 p.m. as well to finish up today's show and get his thoughts on the Masters and maybe a little bit more about that crazy, crazy Sunday afternoon uh, with Akshay Badia winning and uh, booking his ticket to Augusta. So uh, mostly Jets for the first hour and a bit. And then we'll get into uh, the big news locally with the CEBL Championship Weekend and, of course, some Masters talk as well. Just before we bring in Michael Remus, got to thank the sponsors that make Winnipeg Sports Talk happen each and every day. Uh, the great folks at Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada. By the way, great uh, major promo going on right now. If you do like to wager on the golf, check out my Twitter feed or at Cool Bet Canada for details on that. We'll get to the cool bet lines later on. Pretty busy night in the, Nash in the uh, National Hockey League. Of course, the Winnipeg Jets, Wallace and Wallace, F Apparel, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Breezy Bend, Little Brown Jug, Royal Sports, Boston Pizza, Canadian Club, Modern Man Barbershop, Manitoba Battery, and Consolidated Supply. A few of the Preds getting a little bit of extra workout right now after their skate. And speaking of extra work, let's bring in Michael Remus, who is back at the mothership in the peg. What's going on, Reem? Feeling good, us. Warm here, uh, getting ready for playoff weather. So that's great. And yeah, Jets, Preds tonight. Uh, looking forward to seeing how the Jets can avenge their, uh, well, I don't know, beatdown by Nashville that was here uh, a while ago. And I don't know if it sent the Jets into a tailspin. It was when Nashville was on their big hot streak. They've cooled off a little bit, but... The Jets are, I don't know, are they heating up? They're on a three-game win streak. That's pretty good. Better than the six-game losing streak that came before that. So they are trying to get playoff ready as we're seeing teams ramp it up and try to jockey for position here in the Western Conference playoff race. Uh, so I'm doing good, Huss. That was, that was a long answer. I'm doing good. I've recovered from, from the eclipse and, and all that. New day. <laughs> yeah, the eclipse. What a show yesterday. Right in the middle. Of the solar eclipse. Was it a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse? Solar okay, it was a solar, and I was actually l looking into it yesterday. It was a total solar eclipse. And why it's such a big deal, the next one 
the next total solar eclipse isn't coming until like a long time. Um, I think it's 20 years, 20, at least here. I mean, every yeah. year, I think there's always a solar eclipse at some point somewhere on planet Earth during the year. Mm -hmm. It just depends on where you are. And there was a major path throughout the United States, I guess, up into, was it St. Catharines? Uh, somewhere in Canada, I remember. They were all freaked yeah. out because there was going to be people coming from all over the place to uh, take over the area. And the, some of the residents were nervous about it. Yeah, and so I guess... You know, we're in an area where we didn't get like the full eclipse. I was also in a, in a basement. You know, I saw like a lot of productivity was lost in the states to people watching the eclipse. Like, I didn't lose any productivity here. I was trying to look out the window. Is it dark out there? Is it dark? And we watched the we pulled up the NASA stream. So, uh, people are saying the next yeah total one is no no the next partial is twenty forty four. But like total, that was full coverage. So it looked pretty cool where you could get it. It was, you know, I uh, talked to, uh, you know, a few uh, of, uh, friends that are down here for the game as well that were out and about at that time. And I guess it just basically depended on where you were. There was a lot of cloud cover here, but it did open up in spots um, and saw some pretty neat, uh, some pretty neat pictures. We for I uh, ended up, we had quite the evening last night, um, hooked up with Weber Saw our pal Paul Edmonds, and uh, we went by Kid Rock's bar. I can confirm that despite all the bluster from the American badass, Bud Light is very much available at the Kid at the Kid Rock bar. May have had a couple of those last night. I, I tried to get Little Brown Jug, but unfortunately, not available here in uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, but the other great thing was we saw a bunch of uh, of folks in from Winnipeg on uh, a junket they do each and every year. I believe it was WF Financial was uh, putting this on in uh, connection with, I believe, the Bobby Hull Foundation. Um, anyways, it was great to see uh, some familiar faces. And, uh, you know, when, when the team plays here in Nashville, much like Vegas and a few other spots, um, it really is a destination that people will come in and, uh, you know, kind of take advantage of the fact that their team's plan to go out and have a... Uh, have a bit of a blast doing uh, doing what everyone does here in Nashville, wading through a myriad of bachelorette parties and uh, enjoying a few cold ones. And obviously the live music here. I mean, if you are a uh, if you are a fan of live music, not necessarily even country music, this certainly is the place to be. Um, oh, one other thing just quickly before we dive in tonight's game room. Did you see the uh, the picture that I tweeted yesterday? from the rooftop of that chief's bar just to give people an idea of how insanely dangerous Morgan Wallen's stunt of throwing that chair off of the sixth floor window. I, we walked by it yesterday and I looked up and I'm like, that guy is so lucky that no one was hurt or killed. I mean, here's the picture right now for those of you that are with us on YouTube Right at the top of there is like a rooftop bar and barbecue place at uh, Chiefs. I believe that's Eric Church's spot. And you can see right down at the bottom of that photo where the folks are. Um, you know, there was a cop car there. I'd walked by it about 20 minutes earlier um, before this incident happened on Sunday night. And um, I don't know, three felony charges for reckless endangerment. Uh, I'm not sure what ends up happening. He'll certainly be lighter in the wallet. Uh, I'm not sure how hard they'll come down on him, but the absolutely crazy, crazy move by Morgan Wallen to pull that off. And uh, I think uh, he and everyone just thankful that, uh, that no one was, uh, no one was hurt. So Winnipeggers and lots of people out on the town last night. Tonight though, the main event is right here inside the rink at Bridgestone arena as the jets go at it with the Nashville predators. And you know, Remo, you mentioned that game a few weeks back between these two clubs. Um, I would say that this is a chance. I mean, I think we pretty much know where these teams are finishing. Um, certainly when it comes to, you know, Nashville catching Winnipeg, highly unlikely that that happens. But this is a chance, I think, for the Winnipeg Jets to, you know, continue their positive momentum on this three-game uh, winning streak after the six-game losing streak. Um, but also, I mean, a great primer 
as they continue uh, moving through this division and these games that are going to uh, get progressively more difficult, starting off with Minnesota and then finishing off in Dallas and Colorado after the tilt here in Music City. Yeah, I mean, they're playing well. The fourth line uh, has made the big impact. A lot of talk about that still uh, the last couple couple days. So, the, you know, you had the win in Minnesota. Good, you know, this is a nice central road trip, but they have the playoff spot locked up. They're playing Colorado. And again, you had the win. Uh, L.A., very nice win. Good performance from Cole Perfetti and nice performance. So there was a bit of a lull, but you were able to clinch against Calgary. So good opportunity here to get your game right with some, some quality opponents in Nashville, Dallas, Colorado, and then you return home for the final two against Seattle, Vancouver. And I do wonder what the lineups are going to look like for that one. Vancouver, they had a big win yesterday against uh, Vegas, you know, the, trying to solve the seeding issue with the uh, the seeding in the Pacific Division. But the Central, Jets, Colorado, locked in 2-3. We don't know which is going to be which, but it seems as Dallas has number one. So a nice Central Division. Nashville, they're, you know, they're battling for their seeding as well uh, in the wild card spots and also trying to clinch a playoff spot. So a uh, big one tonight in Music City. As you know, It's well, not just a name, you know, Huss. It, it, no, it, it's not. Smashville, Cashville, Nash Vegas. It is one of the cities that has the most um, nicknames, if you will. Um, bottom line, well, tonight it's, uh, it is all about Jets and Preds tonight. And this building, if you've ever been here before, a great, great atmosphere in Nashville. They, uh, they do it right. And, um, you know, one of the things that you know, we've talked about, you know, the um, game experience in, uh, in Winnipeg, um, you know, adding, you know, the building's so small, it's difficult to find a spot for musical acts. Not a problem here in, uh, actually, I'll show you guys this. Not a problem here in Nashville. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the, the stage, I'm not sure if that, right, right there in the middle is the, uh, the Ford band stage. And that's kind of what happens here at intermissions and certainly uh, certainly before. Oh, you just unplugged I just, yourself. I just did. Hold on a second here, Reem. That's okay. Give, well, give me a moment here. Here, before you do, I can go over the uh, notes here from the morning skate. Uh, yeah, you do that. Ken Weeb tweeting out, he's there and he'll join you later. He's tweeting out Sean Monahan, Adam Lowry, Tyler Toffoli, and Neil Pionk. Exercise the option this morning. Took the optional. Connor Hellebuck starts in goal for the Jets. Preds will go with UC Staros. And there was some good news. Bonino Niederreiter. We knew yesterday he was going on the trip. And the Jets posted a beautiful picture of him in his, um, I guess, airplane outfit heading out on the road trip. So that was a positive that he was featured. He took a light skate with Rick Bonus saying after. Really, no timeline for this. They're not going to rush anything. They can take their time. Sounds like not serious. I mean, a guy got cut. Sounds like he he's going to be back, I think, ready for playoffs, Huss, but they're taking their, their time with Nino Nero. Maybe he's back next week. You get a regular season game in, but uh, he's not in today, and they'll reevaluate going forward. Uh, I see you're back. Yeah, we're back. The camera's back in. Apologies on that. We just fired up to show everyone the sounds. It's too bad I can't have this as at the background. One other bizarre thing that is happening, and this must be some sort of cooling cooling issue, but they've got the banners of all of the teams. And for whatever reason, the Ottawa Senators banner just is, it looks like it's in the middle of a hurricane or something. Every other one is quiet. And then it is just bouncing back and forth between the Montreal Canadiens and the Tampa Bay Lightning banners at the start. Um, but back to um, Nino. Of course, Nino's got a lot of fans here in Nashville from his time here with the Predators. Um, like, they certainly don't need to rush him. And we'll get to this with Ken later on. Assuming Nino is healthy and back in very soon, we're going to see... Um, the, the big question is who that 13th forward is. I mean, we had a good conversation yesterday with um, with Hammer about where Cole Perfetti fits in, considering his recent play much improved after really hitting the wall. Um, that I'm not even sure that that's entirely known yet by the guys that make the decisions, Remo, as opposed to uh, who's going to be uh, who's going to be there. Yeah, the big question is where's Cole Perfetti going to fit in, and do the Jets feel like they can play him 
on the fourth line in the playoffs if he doesn't play that you know grinding style game. You know he's we you know he's a smaller guy. You know maybe not. Um, you know the guy who's going to go battle in the corners for the puck. He's more of a playmaker. And so where does he go? And look, he took some time off. And I was talking with a commenter yesterday, has in the comments section. I do uh, check those. And I mean, Cole, I thought he got off to a great season, a great start, and he really did hit a wall, as Rick Bonus said. And uh, But he came back, and he was very good in that game against LA. He's got five points in his last six games. Now I know three of them were in the LA game, but can they play him? And you know, where are Toffoli and Nita, Nita Ryder? Gonna wind up. Um, you know, Nino's been on that spot with uh, Lowry and Appleton all year. Um, you know, I'm I'm not sure how you fit this. I guess the easiest one would be to sit Perfetti unless there's a top six and put um, you know move up to Foley there and put Nita Ryder back. But I don't know. To Foley wasn't really going with Connor and Monahan, so maybe this is something we'll just be going with on a game by game basis. And I know, would they even look at, like, would they separate Lowry and Appleton and have a third line of Toffoli, Lowry, Niederreiter? Like, I'd almost like to see that and keep Perfetti with Monaghan and Connor if that's working. Um, And then you, you know, you have to sort out the fourth line between Appleton, Baron, Nemesnikov, IFL. I I wonder how that would look. Uh, So that's... Yeah, well, I mean, listen, the third line, we've talked about this all season long. I mean, I said at the beginning of the year, I thought they would end at some point with Alex Iafalo playing with Lowry and Niederreiter. That hasn't happened. And listen, I know sometimes Mason Appleton takes some shots, but the guy is having a career year. He's been scoring. He's been putting up assists. And that line has been so good and so consistent for the most part. And it's less about the scoring and more about the matchups as the shutdown line. Listen, I think Alex Iafallo can do that gig as well. Um, the bottom line, though, and again, touch wood, the Jets right now, with the exception of Nino, who will be back soon, fully healthy in the forward group department as well as the defense. And uh, that's a very, very good place to be heading into the playoffs, although you know that that potentially won't last for, uh, <laughs> won't last for a long time. Um, you mentioned Helly in tonight, um, once again, for the Winnipeg Jets, Remo. And, you know, we're going to talk to Max Herz in just a minute about uh, the latest on the Preds in this matchup tonight. Um, you'd be hard-pressed to find many better goaltending matchups all season long than the one we'll see tonight with uh, two of the beasts of the Central Division, the West, and the league, frankly, in UC Soros and Connor Hellebuck. Yeah, Nashville, I mean, they've got a history of having great goaltenders going back all the way. Uh, Thomas Vokun, kind of underrated. Pekka Rene, I mean, they got the Pekka Rene statue there. And now UC Soros, now they got off to, I mean, a really uh, poor start in Nashville, but we all know they heat up, went on that big winning streak. And um, UC Soros, certainly a big part of that. Uh, he just finished up March. Sorry, big February. What six and two, nine two six save percentage, two forty six goals against. You know, overall in the year, his numbers not the most spectacular. Nine oh eight save percentage, two eight zero goals against. But he's a guy they can certainly uh, rely on and be a big, you know, be a big factor for them. Um, you know, I, I don't know if anyone really saw this coming from Nashville, but uh, they certainly turn it up. And goaltending has been a part of that. Yeah, you know it. Um, listen, we're going to hear from Bones uh, a little bit later on. We've got some of the audio from yesterday. He spoke as well after the morning skate. Weaver's going to jump on with us in about half an hour or so. But in just a couple minutes, we're going to welcome in our pal Max Hur. It's great to see him in person here at Bridgestone Arena. Um, just before we do that, spring is here, gang. And that means it is time to get ready for all those projects you've been planning, whether for your home property or commercial Consolidated Supply is ready to go for you. They're the leaders in irrigation systems in Winnipeg and Manitoba. Of course, they also have the uh, best selection of services, including artificial turf, golf carts, the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba, new and used, and other amazing options for your property like hot tubs and great outdoor kitchens as well. They're also the leaders in small engine parts and repair. So much Consolidated Supply can do for you. Pop down and see them, 1395 Niagara Road East. Check them out online at cte.ca. 
I'm talking about golf carts. CT, you can pick up your golf cart and consolidated supply. Then you can head over to Manitoba Battery and get a great deal on batteries for that golf cart. Listen, farmers, people that are getting ready for construction season, you got to have all that equipment powered. And Donnie and the gang have a massive spring sale going on right now at not one, but there are two locations. Of course, they just opened up last month on the south side of the city over in Dover Court. Save money, get the best prices in town, shop local, and get ready to power up your spring and summer at Manitoba Battery. For all the details on the spring sale, go to manitobabattery.com or pop by one of two Winnipeg locations. And guys, hey, if you want a fresh look, a nice cut for the uh, spring and the change of seasons, you know where to go. Modern Man Barber Shop, eight locations in Winnipeg. Great haircuts, shaves, beard shaping, color services, and more, and uh, all the products that you need to keep yourself looking great. Find out more and book your look. Make an appointment online at modernmanbarber.com. Give them a follow on Instagram as well, at Modern Man Barber Shops. And uh, just before we bring in Max, we will see whether Jet fans are cheersing a victory tonight. Um, they'll worry mostly about doing that in the playoffs against most likely the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, but when you think about something great to cheers with and put in, of course, it's Canadian Club, Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey since 1848. And we'll also be enjoying Canadian Club at Princess Auto Stadium this year as CC is the official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Pop by, check it out next time when you were uh, popping by your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. All right, let's get uh, let's get our pal Max Hers in. Uh, great to see you in person, my friend. Great What's to be here, Austin. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming down. We're happy to have you. Hey, it is, uh, and listen, it's always fun. I mean, you don't have to twist people's rubber arm to come down to Nashville, Tennessee and have some fun. Um, and obviously, it's music, it's partying. But tonight, uh, we got a heck of a matchup between two teams that are getting ready to uh, – Try and be at their best come game 83. Yeah, this is uh, second to last home game for the Preds. Last one is this Saturday against the Blue Jackets. So uh, not quite the same caliber opponent as we've got here tonight with the Jets. Preds can clinch with a win. They can clinch with the loser point too. But the plan is obviously to clinch with a win for the team and to celebrate on home ice. So uh, they, they needed some help to clinch over the weekend. They didn't get all the help they needed. They also split the weekend. So it sets up a nice little chance here to clinch at home tonight. Take us, let, let's go back a couple months. Um, this team was right in the midst of, you know, teams that were trying to sort of claw into a wild card spot. Um, what were the expectations beforehand? I mean, it, midway through the season, was this sort of a building year? Um, because I, I tell you what, they did catch the rest of the National Hockey League surprise by surprise going on a heater that, to be honest, I think still is the best in the league this year. So I would say internally, the team players, coaches expected to compete for and make the playoffs. I think externally, the expectations were not quite as far out as the rest of the league, but playoffs were, were maybe a possibility type of season. It was that type of season for them this year. So I, I think the reason things shifted along the way in terms of what people around here and folks like myself in the local media were expecting is because of how well the free agent signings clicked, especially Ryan O'Reilly and Gus Nyquist. So once those guys were going, they unlocked Philip Forsberg. And Phil said last week, he was asked straight up, is this the best you feel like you've ever played, best season you've ever had? And he said yes. And it's because of those guys. He's got career highs in goals, assists, and points. He's had his health, despite the fact that until today, he hadn't practiced in almost two full months. But... Because of things like that, it quickly became a, hey, playoffs are a possibility, though. I think the, the bottom of the West playoff table is much better than the bottom of the East oh, playoff table. It's not even which, close. Yeah, <laughs> maybe a little obvious, but um, it's uh, be, because of that, they were able to compete more than I think anyone outside of the team themselves would have expected or asked you, for. You mentioned Ryan O'Reilly, and I mean, listen, we've seen this guy for a long time, obviously winning the cup with the St. Louis Blues. Um he, how much did he, was he a leader like right when he got in here? I mean, the offseason moves, when you think about moving out to Shane, Ryan Johansson, guys that they'd made big, big investments with that, frankly, probably didn't live up to the commitment that Nashville gave to them. Um, they paid a bit of a price to do that. 
But then bring in O'Reilly in a different role. He seems to be picking up exactly where he was as one of the best two-way forwards in the game, which you might not think of, you know, a a super elite, high-octane offensive center. But this is a guy that helps you win games. And uh, from the outside looking in, he seems to have been a perfect fit here in Nashville. Yeah, it it couldn't have been more perfect. And yes, he was very much a leader right away. The timing of when he was signed played a big part of that. Because as you said, there were some long-tenured players who left the team both this past offseason and at the 2023 trade deadline. So I, I think the thing that really stood out to me, it wasn't a surprise, but he wore an A from the beginning. When they made that announcement in September, Ryan O'Reilly and Ryan McDonough were the two alternate captains this season, and those haven't rotated. They haven't caught anybody else, with the exception of when McDonough missed some games and Colton Sisson's got one. But it's it's those two guys. The former captains, other places are alternates. And O'Reilly got to be an alternate from the first game with the new team, and he's played every game this season, so he hasn't given that up. But the thing that stood out to me last season, at the beginning of the season, Ryan McDonough was acquired from the Lightning via trade, but they hadn't lost anybody to open up the A. So it was Zach Holm and Granlin were still the alternate captains. McDonough gets one after those guys are traded away at the deadline, which was was obvious and we knew would happen. But O'Reilly gets the chance to wear the A right from the beginning. And I, I help that I think that helps explain why he's been so impactful in that way. The timing is a big part of it. Well, and uh, and you mentioned, I mean, Philip Forsberg. I mean, these guys uh, seemingly clicked right away. And I mean, Forsberg signing him was very significant for the organization, considering the moves that they did make moving on from the centers that we talked about before, probably very difficult for the organization to trade Matthias Ekholm, considering what a beast he was on the blue line for a long time. But to get that deal, how significant was it that they kept Philip Forsberg long-term, probably a predator for life? Yeah, definitely so. Now he's got no trade in there too. So, I mean, it would be up to him if he wanted to be anywhere else six years down the road, but we'll worry about that once we get there. But um, it was two summers ago, There was a thought, expiring contract, maybe he would be traded somewhere as a rental, and this was before I covered the team in my current role, but that was in uh, February, March 2022, and he, of course, wasn't traded, ends up signing the eight-year. He actually signed the deal while he was on his bachelor party in Europe. I believe he was in Spain um, and was on the phone with David Poyle as he got it done, which is very funny. Um, But, yeah, that, that was monumental for the team, and as Barry Trotz has taken over, he was very clear from the beginning We've got the best forward in franchise history, Philip Forsberg. We've got the best defenseman in franchise history, Roman Yossi. And we got the best goalie in franchise history, UC Saros. And the standards are high there, especially on forward and on D for for the guys who brought those guys up. Shea Weber brought Roman Yossi up. Pecorine brought UC Saros up. And they're incredibly close. (laughs) And those are the three guys they're choosing to build around. And, And even in a year that was a time of change, they have one of the best players at all three levels. And... That's why they've been so good, and, and everything else has followed from there. Max Hers with us uh, here live at Bridgestone Arena, getting ready for the Jets and Preds to drop the puck tonight here in Music City. You know, you were mentioning Roman Yossi, and I remember being here with uh, our old pal Gary Lawless. We were doing the show on the road on a, a road trip at one point, and we were sit- sitting down hanging out with Stu Grimson, and we were talking about the Predators and we're talking about Shea Weber and just what a beast he was. And obviously he had that crazy long contract, but you know, the, the, the consensus was that this guy was one of the best defensemen in the entire national hockey league. And he goes, listen, I'm not taking anything away from Shea Weber. He's huge, but you, the rest of the league needs to start paying attention to this Roman Yossi, because to be honest, those of us that watch this team day in and day out, He's the best defenseman on this team. And to be honest, is right up there with the best in the league. This was very early in his career. And we knew what happened later on with the trade. Um, even, even with the accolades that Yossi has received, I'm still not sure he gets the appreciation around the National Hockey League that he probably should get as a truly elite top of the table defenseman. Yeah, one Norris in 12 seasons is not enough for what he's won so far. Uh, that the one he won was 2019-20, and then 21-22 he had 97 points as a defenseman, most points in franchise history. Philip Forsberg is eight points away in the last four games from passing it, so that record may hold up. But it's the only 90-point season in Preds history, and he did it as a defenseman. 
while all of the <laughs> forwards around him had career high numbers because of him. And the same thing is happening right now with Forsberg again. And Nyquist has a career high in points and O'Reilly's scoring like crazy. And it's all because of Yossi in terms of how much he generates and the types of things he does in terms of puck movement, cycle, power play running, entries, things like that. So uh, I, I really hope the last couple months have been enough to get him as close to the Norris as he possibly can. I'm sure a lot of people decided on Quinn Hughes very early, and that's part of the reason. I know the voting will be done by then, but that's part of the reason why I would like to see Canucks Preds in the first round, which would be the matchup as of right now, to see Roman Yossi against Quinn Hughes in terms of the guy who probably locked the Norris down in November or December against the guy who made the late push for it at the end. And in my opinion, it would be the same thing with Coach of the Year with Tockett and Brunette. So I think that would be fun because of that. And Brunette had a had a quote probably about three or four weeks ago now after a practice, asked about Yossi's Norris candidacy directly. And he, it, Quinn Hughes was not in the question. He said... I don't think he gets enough love every time through because he's not the shiny new toy. And this year, Quinn Hughes is the shiny new toy. And Yossi's having his best season for a guy who should have two Norrises. He has one. Uh, th this is deserving of round two, second half of the season alone. Um, you know, you're around this team on a daily basis. I, I always laugh. I mean, it's some something about the Swiss guys. I mean, he knows <laughs> the same way. But Yossi just seems to ooze... He's just so cool. Like, what what is he like off the ice, and uh, how is he to deal with? He's very laid back, uh, very similar to Nino, and they're incredible friends. Uh, Yossi had a very vulnerable quote after Nino was <laughs> traded away last February. Like, basically, yeah, I, I just lost my best friend, um, and I got to play with my best friend who'd been my best friend for a long time for two-thirds of a season, and I hoped it would be longer, and my best friend's not on the team anymore. And it's things like that that – are, are not in the cool description, but they're in the honest and mm -hmm. human description. And um, especially as the captain, Yossi obviously does millions of interviews, but he, he's incredible to interact with. He never turns down a, hey, come skate with this group of kids or be with this group, whatever it is. And this week we got to talk about that a lot in a special way because P.K. Subban was back here um, on Tuesday and he'll come back a decent amount a couple times throughout the season, whether it's for media obligations or just to go to a game because he loves it here and the fans love him, things like that. But this past Tuesday was the reunion of a foundation initiative he started here, a charity initiative called Blue Line Buddies, which he started in 2016 right after the Subban Weber trade. And he spoke about it very reflectively this week. It paired Nashville police officers with kids from mostly black families here in Metro Nashville to have them sit together for a game, get together after the game. It's called Blue Line Buddies. And since Subban was traded to the Devils and now retired, Yossi was the one who said, hey, I'm going to take this on. And he was already the captain at that point. He's got enough going on. He's involved yeah. in everything the Preds do charity-wise and community-wise. And he wanted to take that on for PK because it was such an important thing for PK as a new player on a new team. It was during the time of Colin Kaepernick and protests. Subban brought that up this week. That was why he wanted to start it because he wanted to show – that he could be a leader here, and that was why he did it. So Yossi takes on stuff like that, and uh, he does the fun stuff so well, too. Like, we've had a ludicrous amount of funny <laughs> ceremonial puck drops over the last couple seasons. <laughs> the most recent one, you guys might have seen the video for Hockey Fights Cancer this week, the tiny little boy who just did not drop the puck. He wanted to keep holding the puck, and he's a, a one-and-a-half-year-old cancer survivor, and it was Yossi and Braden Shen down there, and Shen is B retailing. Bad in the ice, like, come on, come on, buddy. And Yossi's like, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And it's stuff like that, just just seeing him in those moments uh, a minute before a massive game against the Blues, like the human element. So uh, you're right in everything you said. You know, um, he, he is, and again, he just, I mean, maybe it's being in the market Certainly Canadian media, probably not in Toronto very much, overlooked is uh, is something else. The Nito trade, what did that do to the team? Uh, it, it was the first of four in that week, so it probably felt like the one that made the biggest um, impact in terms of, oh, this is happening, just because it was the first. But the rest of the week was Janot, Ekholm, Randland all traded away in a matter of four days. So I, I think whichever one was first would have felt that way. But um, 
yeah, it's it, he was a beloved player. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, everywhere he's been, I think yeah, he totally. was too. Um, <laughs> but I, I think Nyquist has done this year what Niederreiter did last year, just in a top line role of giving you everything you could ever ask for and more. So, and I think you guys have felt the same thing with Nino and, um. I think everyone in Winnipeg should be overjoyed that he decided not to get to free agency. Oh, Stick around. listen, that, I mean, we talked a lot about the job that Chevel Dayoff has done over the last year. In a lot of ways, it started with the Nino trade and then signing him was, I think, a bonus for the organization. Yeah. Yeah. Was was it three years, four years, four, to- four additional? Excuse me, yeah. four by four. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, hey, and that, uh, and that speaks well in the organization to do that. The guy I haven't brought up yet that is part of, well, I was saying to Remus before, you will not get very many better goaltending matchups than we're going to see tonight. I mean, uh, where's the uh, where's the the UC Saros right now? Following in the footsteps of Rene, who's pretty damn good as well. Yeah, he's uh, he's been at the top of his game through this big Preds run here. Uh, he, he's he's been quiet is the word that Andrew Brunette uses, and he's been so reliable. He makes these massive point Blake saves all the time. He doesn't always face a ton of shots because the Preds have gotten good at shot suppression, but some of the chances he faces are grade A times 10. And he makes these unbelievable saves game in and game out against the Blues last Thursday in a game that if the Blues had won in regulation, I mean, it's it's a much closer reach for them to come down and catch the Preds for the final playoff spot there. He made a season-high 44 saves, and Bruno's down there in the post-game press conference saying, we left our goalie hung out to dry tonight in what turned out to be a 6-3 win with two empty netters. So uh, it's it's games like that that's, that are not close because he prevents them from being close. And the Preds have won so many games by multiple goals over this stretch. Their third periods, the skaters have clamped down and made sure that there isn't the type of great A's you would expect in comebacks, third periods as the Preds pull away or keep other teams pushed away in the third period there. So he, he was amazing Thursday. Sunday night is his uh, most recent start, and he was great against the Devils. Um, it, it took great shots to beat him, and then three for three in the shootout uh, against Myers, Heashear, and Jack Hughes. He, um, I mean, we're spoiled with Hellebuck, um, but I think of the same thing, you know, here. And there's a lot of similarities between the Jets and the Preds to the point that I think in a lot of ways when the Jets became a team coming from Atlanta – this was sort of a model that they had looked at, and it's certainly turned into a great rivalry. Of course, we remember the playoffs in uh, 2018, which was really the highlight of you know this team's existence going to uh, going to the conference finals. Um, this team is going to the playoffs right now. Back it up, whatever it was, six, seven uh, weeks ago. What was the turning point? What was the catalyst for that incredible run that this team put together? I think it was just a hot at the right time type moment, and. Uh, they they were really unhappy with their play in the first three games out of the All-Star break. And they actually won the first game out of the break against the Coyotes in a close, low, close high-scoring game that they probably didn't deserve to win. Then they lost to the Devils here. These were all home games. All three of these were home games. They lost to the Devils, and then they got crushed by the Stars 9-2. Uh, then they go on the road, and they have a 5-0 and road week, which was supposed to include the extended Vegas stay. It did not include the extended Vegas stay. <laughs> and then they continued to go 11 0 and two in their next 13 for an 18 game point streak. So uh, the lineup clicked. It's uh, they got hot at the right time. And I think it's a product of, of the new system and everything Andrew Brunette has put in, in terms of the pressure and the principles and things like that coming into effect and the lines being in the right balance where everybody's able to produce that the five and O road week that started in St. Louis, then Vegas, LA, San Jose and Anaheim, they won all of those games by multiple goals. They did not trail at any point in five straight road wins, which is insane. So obviously they scored first in all those yeah. games and all 12 forwards scored a goal at some point in those five wins. So that was when it's like, oh, it's it's not just the top line anymore because it was for a long time, but they were doing enough to win games. It was the defenseman generating every forward was scoring and it wasn't just Forsberg's line that was being leaned on at that point. And that hasn't stopped. There have been very few lineup tweaks. The trade deadline caused a couple of things. Jason Zucker has fit in great. Anthony Bavillier got back in there last week and has looked much better over the last three games as he tries to get comfortable in the system. So they'll both be in there tonight as well. Uh, but they, they made the they made two nice little buys with Zucker, who they got really cheap for a oh, sixth round pick because nobody else could deal. take on his pro rated. Yeah. 
Um, and that and Bavillier, who I think has looked good in spurts. Um, so they've been great. The biggest move was a sell move. Yakov Trenin for a third round pick. They said, hey, we know we're not going to sign this guy as a pending UFA. Um, and they have people in the minor leagues. Zach LaRue is the guy that they're talking about who could fill his spot cheaper long term going forward. So uh, they decided to trade him. And they kept Carrier, who was the other pending UFA, who they think they have a shot to keep. But Barry Trotz also said trading him wouldn't have been worth the potential upsetting of team chemistry with his partnership with Jeremy Lozon. Yeah, there's a lot of folks. I mean, we were talking about, and again, this was a little bit before the, you know, when we weren't sure whether they were going to potentially be sellers. I was a guy kind of under the radar that I think a lot of teams would have been interested in and do it. Speaking yeah. of deals, well, how's Colin Miller healthy scratch tonight, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, so. He's been, I mean, he's kind of come in and out of the lineup. The Jets Listen, touch wood. They've been very, very healthy right now, especially on the blue line. Um, it's a good guy to have since it's good insurance, right shot, you know, can fire the puck. But I think they're going on. They're looking at Logan Stanley a little bit more. He's a guy that had been underwhelming, to be honest, for most of his time as a Jet. He's made the most of his opportunities coming back in, and uh, he's going to uh, get to get another. Uh, and he fought Alex Carrier last year. Yeah, yes. Uh, not a fair fight. <laughs> um you we talking about these deals. How's uh, how's Barry Trotz doing? He's a uh, he's a beloved individual back in Manitoba. He's beloved here too. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll fight you guys for him for sure. But um, he has handled everything the right way this season in terms of his job and in, in terms of public facing stuff, interviews, the way he treats people. Um, it's been amazing, and he he has not followed anybody's set path in terms of how to be an NHL GM in basically every way, and. I think all of it has worked out well. He he hasn't held anything back when he does interviews. He answers the question. Um, he he doesn't he doesn't slow down injuries. He he won't hesitate to go after a guy if he doesn't think they're playing well when he does weekly interviews on our radio station. Um, no, it's been amazing. He treats everybody so well. And uh, as you see here in our press box, like we're kind of in the crowd, so like he has to walk through the crowd <laughs> quite a bit to get to the locker room and in and out throughout the game and. He will stop and talk to anybody, any fan who's being nice to him, but I haven't seen anyone be mean to him, but um, anytime, like he will talk to anybody and he's had so many people that he knows, whether it's people he's known forever or looser connections, things like that, just show up and be at morning skates. So they go, we're got some Barry Trots and things like that. And it's, it's things like that, that make him such a good fit here and make me understand for someone who didn't cover him as a head coach here why the culture is the way it is. And a lot of it is because of him, because he's so welcoming. So just like extending the branch to everybody like, Hey, welcome to our hockey world. We're interested in where you come from. We want you to be a part of what we do here. We are going to make sure you fit in. And I think his team right now reflects that too. He is. Uh, I mean, listen, he's a special guy, a great hockey man. And uh, we famously offered him free beer for life. And that didn't, that <laughs> didn't get him to Winnipeg, but um, it seemed like he was set on this and, and his heart has been in Nashville, even when he left for, yeah. uh, for the Island. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, he was back on long Island this weekend for the first time. I was not with the team for that game, but uh, they, they brought him back on the big board gave him his big welcome. And people are chanting Barry trots. And I mean, here they are a, a year and a half later, uh, digging themselves a unique Patrick wash, hey, pole. And, uh, you're in for Barry Chops. <laughs> hey, I just quickly uh, before we go, let's look ahead to the playoffs. Um, if the team, assuming they're going to be a wild card team, um, is there a preference on which side? I mean, that did, specifically the Vancouver Canucks. How do they feel? I, I, I'm trying to think of the games between the clubs this season, but uh, all a while ago. What, yeah. We, okay, and, and this team was very different at that point yeah. as well. Yeah. So, uh, Pre Preds were zero and three against the Canucks. Um. I think the last one was in it was either November or December, but they were here twice. Preds only went to Vancouver once. Um, Canucks looked good in those games, and that was right as they were really uh, – people were still debating whether or not they deserved to be as good as they were with the the expected goals and the PDO and yeah. whatever the heck was going on with them. Um, but, no, I, I think – from my point of view, that's the matchup I've wanted for a while, um, even before the Stars got as hot as they've been. Um, I, I think the I think the top three central teams are – it's them and Edmonton for the four best in the West, I think. And uh, I think, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the Preds have more playoff experience than the Canucks do. So oh, yeah. That's uh, 
that's another reason I, I think that could work out well. Um, Oilers in the second round, if the Preds were to beat the Canucks, uh, that would be a tall task. Um, but I mean, I, I don't think the Preds are at the point where they want to be where they're thinking about it anyway. So, um, I would like to go back to Vancouver. So that's a uh, part of the reason why I've wanted that <laughs> one for a while. But like I said, the storylines, like, I, I just think that'd be such a fun series. Yeah. Listen, I, I can't wait. I mean, the, the playoffs in the West, regardless of how it shakes out, it's going to be four phenomenal series between eight teams that all deserve to be there. Yeah. Well, I was I, at one point, everything lined up that would have been huge rivalries and it would have been you guys and the Kings for the uh, whole trade rematch. Um, but I know that's not going to happen anymore. But uh, the, the way it had lined up, what was it? It was Stars, Abs, you guys and the Kings, Preds and Canucks, and then Oilers, Knights. Like, that would have been bloodbath first-round series. And I don't think any of those are going to happen now. Bring round. it on. Well, I'll tell you what, dude. We're going to have a heck of a matchup tonight. We straight up pick them uh, in this one. And uh, who knows? Maybe cross our fingers. These teams will play again later on. That'll be fun. <laughs> Sign me up for that. Max, thanks yeah. so much for doing this. Great man. to have you here. Absolute pleasure. There's Max Hers um, joining us to fill us in on the Nashville Predators. We're hosting the Winnipeg Jets tonight. Uh, Weber's coming up in just a second. First off, let's uh, cheers to our friends at Little Brown Jug. We're not just for the showboats or the champions. We're here for the good ones. The ones who work hard and show up for others not to get recognized, but because it's the right thing to do. We'd like to think that our good intentions show up in our beer. We keep working to perfect it, not because we want fame or fanfare, but because you deserve it. 1919, the good you deserve. Friends at Little Brown Jug. Hey, I also want to thank our great support from the folks at Wallace and Wallace. Uh, of course, spring is here, gang. And if you're looking for a new fence, Wallace and Wallace has been the fencing and overhead door specials for over 70 years. But time is of the essence. If you book your fencing uh, job by April 15th, Wallace and Wallace can guarantee installation by the end of May. And uh, you and your family will enjoy the entire summer on the brand side of a new fence. Give Wallace and Wallace a call, 452-2700, and book. Uh, and don't get in line. Book it and get that uh, in as well. WallaceandWallace.com as well uh, for more information on that. Um, listen, uh, we've got a very well-dressed individual about to join me here um, live at Bridgestone. Um, if you need to up your menswear game heading into spring and summer, wedding season, of course, you know what to do. F Apparel, 190 Smith Street downtown. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks. Uh, capris or golf pants. Tucked and untucked shirt styles. Got you covered, guys, with everything you need heading into a spring and summer. And don't forget, 15% discount uh, for wedding parties when you get your suits at F Apparel. You can find out more online, ephapparel.com, and pop down and see them at 190 Smith Street. Uh, all right, look who's here. Ken Weeb of the Winnipeg Free Press. Can you hear me? I can I can hear you, but not through my headphones. Interesting, interesting. I guess I didn't realize. There, how about that? Yes. But a professional, good. Max, is just did 25 <laughs> minutes without being able to hear it. I don't know. I guess didn't we are. bother to we, tell you. We are close enough. How are you doing? Good, buddy. Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Fun time last night, seeing the fellas, getting Indeed. out a little bit. Indeed. Nashville was uh, was booming, as usual. Hey, you know what? It's, uh, it was neat. I just still can't believe I met you on that rooftop patio looking across. We showed the picture before. <laughs> Of where Morgan Wallen threw the chair off. I, the more I look at that, I mean, he's so lucky that someone didn't get killed. Oh, wild! Yeah, not not uh, not a good life choice by Mr. Uh, Wallen. No, not a good life choice. Definitely not. Um, we didn't see any chairs being thrown. No, no, just uh, just uh, well, just good times. Except had at WrestleMania. At WrestleMania, <laughs> we saw a few chair tosses. How about that? Apparently, big raw last night. Dustin Nielsen was filling me in on the lock shop. Oh. He's wrestling so back. He's like hadn't watched in a long time. He's like, oh my god, hot. She should have seen Raw last night. He's uh, he's all in. Um, we could talk wrestling for a while, but let's talk about this till tonight. I mean, sure. you were down in the room afterwards. Uh, give us a quick update from Mother Morning Skate. 
Yeah, Logan Stanley will be staying in on the back end on the third pairing with Dylan Sandberg. Otherwise, no changes uh, to the lineup. Uh, there was a Nino Niederreiter sighting. Uh, went out for a quick twirl uh, at the end of the morning skate. Now, it was more, I would say it was more leisurely slash gingerly hus. Uh, but it was important for him to take the next step and to get out there on the ice. Uh, I looked, you know, pretty pretty good moving around. But again, uh, Rick said afterward there's no timeline. But when pressed, he, he said he wanted to get him in a full practice. And that full <coughs> practice will be on uh, Friday in Denver. So I would say the earliest he would return, Huss, would be Saturday against the Colorado Avalanche. But it's also possible they wait until the Tuesday game against Seattle. Depends how the, you know, how the body feels afterward, after he goes today, get some treatment and everything else. But I would say it was, it was a positive development, considering Rick said yesterday to the folks in Winnipeg that were there, he wasn't sure when he'd be on the ice. So I would say that looks like a sign of progress for me. Uh, line, no changes to the lines. Uh, I know that's been a topic of, uh, of great debate here the last little while. But uh, yeah, they're going to keep the same lines. Will they keep them through the game? Now that will be the next question that we ask. But I, I think they're going to give them a little bit more run. I know that we're always looking between the lines and, you know, Rick did say that he needs more from that top line uh, in terms of you know, chances generated and chances converted. Uh, but it's definitely going to start that way. And I think they'll give him a little bit more run and, and they should. I mean, but when Rick says they haven't been playing like they were in December, that's true. But I mean, some of it is they're under some of the underlying numbers are still still solid. Looks a heck of a lot better than the line that he had uh, in that spot before. I mean, I don't think there's can even be an argument on that. No, that's fair. I, I just think that the I'm just still not sure that it's the optimal trio. Now, again, I'm not sure what the optimal trio is. And I also, too, some folks are, are making a big deal out of saying, well, yeah, they're 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 breaking even. And that hasn't always been the case for um, Kyle Connor and Mark Scheife. We know that. Uh, but I would also say if we're if we're looking at it around the around the central division, house like you just were, um, the goal of your top line should not be to break even. Like your top top line has to be a dominant line, uh, and based on well, how come things... playoff time, if you told me that the Jets could even up their top line against the Avalanche top line, right? But I think they're set up to win. No, but they're probably not playing against each other all that often, right? But sure, I, I well, I they will you're... be in Colorado. No, tr true, true. <laughs> uh, what I mean is that Jared Bednar is not going into the series telling Nate McKinnon, "I would love you." To for you to break even with Mark Scheifele. That's not how their top line operates. Oh, no, no. I'm speaking from a Jets no, perspective. No, no, no. And, and I get that. I'm, I'm just saying in terms of, of perspective, I know that there was some blowback uh, on the Twitter machine this week uh, when I suggested I didn't think that that line was playing particularly well all the time. I, I've liked parts of it. I just don't see the cohesion that we saw in December when they were taking the other team's lunch money essentially in a lot of those games now again did i expect that to happen in three games no i did not so it's not surprising that it hasn't just snap your finger and worked i think that nikolai ehlers is you know still flying a lot uh doing a nice job on a lot of fronts but the most concerning thing for me hassan and i know it's not everything but mark shifley one shot in three games that's not going to work out for the Winnipeg Jets when they're playing. And again, we know he's doing other other things in in, in the game itself. And it, the most important thing for Mark is that his 200-foot game, I think, has still been solid. But we talked two weeks ago about Mark needing to be 2018 Mark Shifley. It's tough to score 14 goals and get 20 points if you're only having one shot every three games. And now, again, this is just a little bit of a lull. But it's something where he's going to need to elevate. And, and the other thing that I mentioned the other day too, Huss, Kyle Connor had a beautiful backdoor tap-in that was created by Sean Monaghan. He also didn't have another shot on goal in the game. So now again, you need your fourth line to carry you if you're the Winnipeg Jets on occasion. And they did carry them in that game on Saturday against the Wild. They carried them with three, three goals, one from each player. So I just think that the top six has room for improvement and that's probably the case with most top sixes around the league but it just feels like you know if we're talking about dallas and colorado those teams are not wondering who's going to be playing on their top line or their second line going into the stanley cup playoffs so the fact that it's it's gone this late into the season without a definitive answer probably not ideal for the coaching staff no i, I and it's funny we were talking about how deep this team is and how the fourth line and the third line have certainly been carrying their weight. Yep. Um, 
to your point, I mean, having that uncertainty is probably not something that Bones is fired up about right now. Um, and I guess, well, what, are you, what are they trying to get out of these final five games of the regular season? Yeah, I think they're trying to get second place in the in the, in the Central Division, which would allow them to have a little bit of a matchup manipulation for that matchup with Nathan McKinnon in that line uh, that is so dominant. Now, just briefly, uh, for those folks who didn't see it, it, it sounded like Jared Bednar told reporters in Denver that uh, Miko Rantanen was on the ice. I think he is in concussion protocol, but... Uh, the fact that he was able to get back onto the ice so quickly, Hus probably, you know, would lead someone to believe, you know, again, head injuries, setbacks, you know, you do, you never really know for sure. But for some folks who are wondering if maybe Rantanen might not be ready for game one, I would say the fact that he's on the ice so quickly after probably uh, means that that's not the case. But again, what are the Jets trying to accomplish? They need to be sound, A, sound defensively. They need their special teams to improve dramatically, probably, at least incrementally, if not dramatically. And at least one of those units has to be going us. You either have to have the power play going or you have to have your penalty kill uh, operating a level that's not around 76%. Because when the games get tight in the playoffs, 76% is not going to cut it unless your power play is operating at an Oilers-esque level in the mid-30s. So, and that's asking an awful lot on that front. Uh, I think they want to keep uh, Connor Hellebuck in a rhythm. I know this was one of the games that I thought might be a Lauren Brassois game, Huss, uh, but Lauren Brassois, I expect, will be starting Tuesday against the Dallas Stars. Okay. That's my... I've altered my prediction, <laughs> and I had altered it before the weekend. I'm not just trying to say well, hindsight is 2020 20 here, but... Uh, so that would allow him to probably... Will he get Seattle? I, I think so. It'll depend on how the next couple of games go. But I would think maybe the next appearance would be against Seattle. And then uh, could Hellebuck maybe just play two periods against Vancouver and maybe you give Brassois the third? Now that would also force the Jets to find one other relief appearance. Yes. Even if it's just for 10 seconds in order to get Lauren Brassois to that 25 game mark, which would allow him to be on the Jennings Trophy, provided the Jets are able to uh, secure the you know, lowest goals against in the NHL this season. Um, and sorry, they also need to sort out a good segue here. They need to sort out who's on the third pairing. And well, I was just the about to ask back you open. this. So Stanley's in tonight, right? Nate Schmidt is out along with Colin Miller. Is this the six defenseman the Jets start with in game one? It's possible. Uh, I still, you know, I would say body of work wise, you know, we talked all year long about the you know the, the underlying numbers for Sandberg and Schmidt. So I, I don't think that Nate Schmidt is out of game one, but I would say that they're definitely giving Logan Stanley a long leash here, Huss, and that leash could it extend to Dallas? It, let, let's just put it this way: if the leash extends to both Dallas and Colorado, then it's probably a pretty good indication if that's the way that they're leaning. But for right now, we know that Colin Miller, Nate Schmidt, and Logan Stanley all played in, the, in one of the three previous games. So I'm not ready to say Logan's won the job. I would say he's definitely bridged the gap. Let's put it that way. And just in terms of the stylistic play, you know, at some point the Jets are going to have to decide if they want Logan Stanley or Nate Schmidt against the Colorado Avalanche. Now, to me, that's the that should probably be the biggest tell who plays on uh, Saturday. That'll be, but you know, it's not just a one game referendum. This is this is body of work that you have to consider. But what we do know, Hus, is that the Jets are impressed by how Logan Stanley has handled this tough situation of being out a lot, and they think he's probably playing his best hockey of the season. So, I mean. You'd want to be playing your best hockey at the season, at the biggest time of the season. Speaking of that, you were at XL Energy Center. What did you think of him on Saturday? I, I liked his game. I mean, I, I, it wasn't super flashy. I didn't, but there also weren't. He's not making. It a really lot of, is. Th there aren't a lot of errors being made either, Huss, Right, and that's the bottom line for him. For sure. I, I, to me, I think he's. I think he's skating well. That's something that you've really noticed, and Huss, That that's probably the most impressive part, because. The bag skates are not fun for all people, for not for many people. They're not fun, but they are a prerequisite because even with the benefit of the conditioning skates, you still aren't in game shape. So to be able to translate that into 
your on ice performance is really impressive and, and it's something that uh, Logan Stanley quite frankly has done a very good job at he's played a much more assertive game Hus uh, more not, and not just like we said not just the fighting but the physical nature that element's important but you have to have your mobility I mean if you you need mobility against the avalanche they play you know at least one and a half of their lines play at hyper speed when they're on their game so yeah uh, but again most defensemen are going could end up on a highlight reel against Nathan McKinnon. This is not this is not news. This is this is not a new development. He does it against the best in the NHL. So I, I would say that I liked his game, and for Logan, it's, it's important to just keep stacking uh, solid performances. And you know he's talked about it too. He sort of tried to make it more of a simplistic game, and when he plays that style of game uh, and an assertive game, it can be a very effective game. And now again, Dylan Sandberg is being asked to play his offside. That's a ch- like, that's a challenging thing to do For late sure. in the year, but I think he's handled it pretty well. And uh, it, it's the door is open. Let's just put it that way. The door is open. The gap has been bridged, and we're gonna know more probably. And you know what it, we may not know honestly until the game eighty three alive. Game one, but uh, and even then there could be some some ins and outs happening there. Uh, it's that time of year where. Uh, coaches can sometimes uh, you know, try to throw us a curveball or two in the spirit of the season of baseball. All right, listen, this may be opening up the door to the buffet. <laughs> However, I have to ask you this. We had a great conversation with Hamilton yesterday. Interested sure. in your thoughts. Nino gets healthy, and assuming the Jets have a full complement of their players, um, Who's the odd guy out of the 13 forwards? Uh, you know, assuming the Kapari and Gus are extras. Yep. Nino comes in. Who's coming out? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I can tell you it's not going to be, and it's not going to be Tyler Defoley coming out, Huss. So um, that would lead you to believe that it's probably the player who's playing in Tyler Defoley's expected spot come uh, game one, and that would be alongside Sean Monahan and uh, Kyle Connor. And, that's probably going to be Toffoli for me. Uh, I give Cole Perfetti an incredible amount of uh, respect and uh, acknowledgement for what he's been able to do. To it's not easy to re reestablish your game, Hus, in the in this part of the of the season for an undersized player. Who, you know, I think the the pace was kind of catching up to him, which is natural because it's the most he's ever played at an NHL level this late into the season when the games are really a grind. So, do I think it's for sure that he's out in game one? No. Uh, you and I, you listen, like, Sean and I don't agree on this. I think uh, Cole Perfetti is a legitimate option for the fourth line because in a game, you can bump him up. For me, I don't see that as an issue. But I think the most likely fourth line is going to be Morgan Barron, Vladislav Nemestikov, and Alex Iafalo. And I think that because Iafalo is on the top penalty killing unit with Adam Lowry. So he's built for the playoffs. Exactly. And I, and I had a great conversation with him today about that for that'll be in the free press in the, in the in tomorrow morning and up later on today. His game, he can play with anybody, but he's the kind of guy that will score an overtime winner or a series clincher or you know, if a team is down in a game He's the kind of guy who's going to dig out the puck and find a way to feed somebody uh, on the back door or be Johnny on the spot for a big goal. Uh, you know, again, and Alex Iafalo is, a, it's been a long time since Alex Iafalo was a fourth line player. Like, this is a guy who played routinely with Anze Kopitar, like on one of the top mm-hmm. lines. So uh, the fact that the Jets have that luxury is important for them. But again, very similarly to Logan Stanley, Cole Perfetti is very much in a day-to-day battle. Like I said, it's not a referendum every night, but the margin for error for those guys to be in game one, rather than the players that are probably ahead of them on the depth chart, is razor thin. So, uh, you know, that means they, they really need to be finishing the season strong, Huss, and I expect Cole to continue to play at a high level. I love, I've talked to him recently, like his confidence level is very high and and that's essential because if you're not confident, you're not going to be playing at the speed required. That's a a significant change from about three weeks ago. Uh, Agreed. And that's when I I also think that, you know, 
Cole is incredibly hard on himself. And I think that the game was not coming as... And again, for someone that intelligent, when you get overthinking, now everything's... like Sometimes you want to slow down the game. We talk about it with quarterbacks all the time. But for Cole, like slowing the game down means something different. And, and to me, it sort of went from... It went from his, uh, you know brain to his legs to a certain degree if that makes sense i just don't think that he was moving at you know his anticipation is so strong it allows him to maybe make up for the perceived skating not a deficiency but he's not a burner so that means he has to get by with you know being alert hockey sense and anticipation i think there was a stretch of games or hus when he went through the long slump that he sort of not lost his confidence but his confidence was shaken and it also meant that he wasn't doing the things that he needed to do to be an effective player in a top six role. So uh, I think he's done an excellent job of finding himself, finding his game. And I expect to see Cole Perfetti in the playoffs. I'm just not sure it's going to be in game one. Yeah, I, listen, I Though think that's fair. it still could be. Again, and I'm not trying to sit on the fence here. I'm saying that it, it, the competition is legitimately still open. But I do think it's most likely... I just don't see a scenario where, you know, the Jets brought in Tyler Toffoli because A, he's a finisher, and B, he's a Stanley Cup champion. I don't see any scenario that Tyler Toffoli is not involved in a higher up the lineup role. And some people would say, well, just play him on the fourth line. Well, you could, but that's not why he was brought here. And I actually, us, quite frankly, I think Tyler Toffoli has been a lot more noticeable in the last two games since he came back from the illness. Yeah. Uh, Ten shots on goal is just one item. I thought he was moving really well, and he's he's looking for his shot again. And and that's when he's dangerous, look out. Well, I mean, we talked a lot about, you know, I, I have Fallow and, you know, what uh, he's able to do in around playoff time. Tyler Toffoli, a different different style player, but... I Difference mean, maker. Big time. And listen, it's about big plays at big times and uh, scoring goals. And he uh, has a knack for shooting the puck and scoring a big one um, come playoff time as well. Um, listen, I know we've spent so much time talking about the top line and now it's Ehlers, uh, yeah. you know, with uh, with Mark Shifley. And we're going to hear what Bones had to say about this coming up in a minute. Um, how do you see, like, you know, we've kind of talked about it. It just seems like at times the coaching staff is just looking for a reason to go back to where they were. Like, is this a game-by-game basis? And when the minute they don't have things going it's going to go back to where it was before or can you see this maybe continue through to begin the playoffs yeah i mean i i know that kind of rick hinted at maybe an itchy trigger finger in the quote but i'm not I'm not certain he actually feels that way or is going to act that way um let's just but, think about the calgary game I mean, no, no, which fair. was yeah. i mean almost humorous in the way that everything transpired no, with the change fair. and then going back to it and credit to them for going back wait a second what are we doing no, Let's get that's back totally to it. fair. And it was a strange scenario because it came out of that power play scenario to begin with. And then they scored right away. And then he was like, oh, well, maybe we should try it for a few more shifts. But that did definitely coincide with the lull in the game for the Jets. But, I mean, it, it just, it, it's sort of, not. I wouldn't say it's shift by shift, but I would say it's game by game. But I would say that a couple important developments for me, Huss, that I've noticed here. Sean Monaghan really looking sharp again his skating is really solid he's driving that second line in my personal opinion Cal Connor's done a nice job of contributing a little bit more offense in the last uh, three games since moving over there I think whatever five points in three games it's not just about points but Kyle's got to be a little bit more assertive and looking for his shot too Huss a lot of assists and the three assist to me the three assist game against the Kings was very important for Kyle Connor Huss because the Kings play a, you know, pretty defensive style that, you know, again, the Avalanche play that way the same as the Kings. No, they do not. But they're a good defensive team that's won the Stanley Cup. So you're going to have to be involved offensively and generating. And I loved his patience with the puck in that Kings game specifically. Set up a lot of good plays. The interchange with Josh Morrissey that uh, went off the skate of Monahan, impressive. The saucer pass he makes to Perfetti, Perfetti to Morrissey. Those are elite hockey plays by Kyle Connor, and it meant he was moving his feet, and that's what I loved about that game. I didn't find him as dangerous against the Wild personally, but I do think that there's starting to be some chem- like 
this may sound wild, but I think there's been more chemistry between Monaghan and Connor than there has between Shifley and Ehlers. But that's why, I, you know, again, the biggest thing for the Jets is that Velarde has come back, Huss, and is playing at a very high level, and his conditioning is up at a high level that it needs to be at in order for him to be a first-line driver, right? So I don't, you know, I think that Velarde would work great with Monaghan, but... If you decided to go Ehlers, Connor, and Shifley, but I think that Gabriel Velarde does so much for that line in terms of his board play and battles down low, and his willingness to kind of hang on to the puck, that I would I wouldn't be moving Gabriel Velarde. And again, I understand why some folks are scared of it, but I also think that Ehlers and um, Monahan work well together. I know some people don't think the numbers line up with that, but I've seen them really drive. But then the thing is, you got to get Ehlers a little bit more ice time if he's not on that line with Mark Scheif. And again, I'm not advocating for Ehlers to be moved. I'm just saying that I think on the chemistry side of things, we know there's more offensive zone chemistry with Mark Scheifele and Kyle Connor. Does that mean they should play together? No, not necessarily. But I don't think we can ignore that. Is that true? Like, is that the case? They generate a lot together, Huss. It's just the problem is they give up a fair amount. It's not like the numbers speak for themselves. They, so the they numbers, the, are the offensive amount. numbers are better with Connor. Well, I'm not 100 sure. I'd have to look a little bit closer. I just mean in terms of because we've always thought that, and, and like and I get it. That's it's sort just of the co- something. The cohesion element. I, I just think there's a lot of times where Mark isn't sure where Nikolai is going to be, and I also think that's maybe vice versa. There are times when I don't know that... And the, the biggest issue for me with that line when it doesn't work, again, we've talked about it a lot. Sometimes when the symphony is hitting all the right notes, it's glorious to watch. But sometimes the oboe is out of tune and then it looks very disjointed for those two guys. So that's not to say it can't be better. And I think it, it will be better if they stick with it. It just, I think that that element... That unpredictability is part of what makes Nikolai Ehlers great, but Mark prefers a straight-line player that he knows where he's going to be in terms of finding him. And again, I, I think that's also part of why his shots on goal are down in the last three games, because maybe he's not he's trying to figure out where Ehlers is going to be instead of just thinking, puck's on my stick, bam, shoot it. But again, I also know some people believe that that's more related to power play numbers, that his numbers are down. And that they're you know finding places elsewhere to get shots. And we know Mark is a pass first player, but we can't also ignore the fact that he had 42 goals last year and has one of the best releases in the NHL. So uh, I'm very curious to see how it turns out. And again, it, it's going to be part of the fascinating part of the journey. And my point through all of this is not break them up. My point through all of this is that there is no way the Jets are going to win four rounds unless Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor are playing at an elite level. I just don't see it. As, mu- as much depth as the Jets have, they have to have those two guys going and not just purring along. They need to be like turbo boost acceleration, like in the in the red zone here, like absolutely going on all cylinders, or else it's going to be a challenge for them. Can, can those, listen, this is a pretty simple question. I mean, like if, if they're back, we've seen what's happened all season long. I mean, can, can those guys hang in a head-to-head matchup against Nathan McKinnon and his line? Yeah, I mean, like we're 10 days removed from the hat-trick in New York, right? I mean, so I, I don't think we can say that. I mean, that's they one game, though. I, I, I mean, no, no, I think I, we've got a lot of other games. I get games. it. I get it. I get it, Huss. But, I mean, the Jets were also in first place for a lot of the time when those guys were together until December 10th when, when Kyle got hurt. So... And, Just strictly and I don't on a matchup that, level. And I don't think that they were, you know, they weren't getting hemmed in on every single shift, right? I mean, but at the same time, the recent evidence, and I understand the body of work is not at a level that is high enough to be going toe-to-toe. They can hang with them, but not if it's a track meet, right? Unless something changes dramatically. I, I Jets would... can't get in a track meet with Colorado or they're going to be out. I mean, and this goes back to your point. And I mean, I, to me, Connor almost is secondary in this conversation to Shifley. I mean, Shifley needs to be the guy for the Winnipeg Jets in a series 
going up. And and to be honest, I mean, I was I think I mentioned this on Monday's show, watching that game Friday night between the Avalanche and the Oilers. Yep. And the close ups on oh, McKinnon and McDavid going at each other, the speed going back, the tenacity of the guys and how much they were focused on checking the other player. And it got me thinking about a potential series against those Avalanche that this could in fact be the biggest challenge of Mark Shifley's career. For sure, and that's fair, but I also think that he would welcome that, right, Huss? I mean, we we know that well, how important it was for him to get that contract signed and everything else. Mark is a guy who, I mean, we, we heard Connor Hellebuck talk about the legacy element mm-hmm. uh, when he was talking about his 500th game with Paul Edmonds and I and Scott Billick. Uh, Mark is not really, you know, outwardly puff your chest out and talk about legacy person, but he knows there's a statue outside the building of someone who's very dear to his heart. And, you know, all joking aside from what Paul Maurice said years ago, Mark would like a statue at some point too, I would imagine, Huss. And you know what the best way to get a statue built is? Not, not just be a Hall of Famer, but bring, bring a different silver trophy home um, to Winnipeg. And for him to do that, he's going to have to go head-to-head with some of the best players in the NHL. That's like that for every single player. But for him specifically, he's going to need to be playing at a at an elite level. And and that's that's absolutely vital. Again, it's not all on Mark Shifley, just like it's not all on Connor Hellebuck. But when you're playing the top competition, your top competition has to be great. That's why we said it. In the game against the Rangers, Huss, Mark was the best player on the ice, right? There was no well, argument there. Took over that game. So... Can you do that against the, you know, potential hard trophy winner? Now that's the next challenge in, you know, a week and a half's time whenever that series starts. So I think he would welcome the challenge. But, yeah, I mean, he also welcomed the challenge to go against McDavid and Dreisaitl in the year that they swept them. Yep. Right? So I I think he can elevate his game come playoff time. He has done it before. Now we know there have been some recent hiccups, suspensions, injuries, everything else. But Mark's best hockey was played in the 2018 playoffs against the Minnesota Wild and then against the President's Trophy winner in this building, right? So, but no, neither one of those teams had a Hart Trophy centerman that he had to go against, but he had he was playing against Roman Yossi in the series where he was very dominant, right? So he can do it. It's just he needs to A, stay healthy, and B, stay in the series. And if when Mark Scheifele's been in the series for the Jets with the exception of the year against the Blues, when Ryan O'Reilly did a really good job against him and won the matchup, Mark's been a pretty dominant player in the playoffs. Now, you could argue he wasn't as dominant against Vegas. That's true. But the Jets as a whole didn't score. Line A didn't score much outside of the power play goal in Game 4. Uh, Ehlers didn't score at all that series. So the Jets have a lot of other weaponry that can put up big-time numbers. And then that goes back to our point from earlier. Toffoli is the kind of guy that if he gets the puck in a tie game in the fourth overtime in the high slot, he can bury it. Oh, now you're right? getting me excited for the playoff. Just a mention <laughs> of for a fourth <laughs> overtime. Let's go. Hey, listen, before and we go. Let's hope that's on an afternoon game <laughs> and not on a uh, 8 p.m., 9 p.m. Hey, start. Okay, Bring it on whatever time. Start it whenever hey, come you on, want. you got to be thinking of the newspaper guys here, here once in a while, it. all right? Well, okay. Sorry. Let it newspaper. be an afternoon yes. game. <laughs> Let it be an afternoon game. Um, Ken, um, you were there. I laughed. I mean, you asked Rick about the power play, and his <laughs> his response was classic bones. Um, just thoughts on where the power play is is at, and how crucial it is that they start getting some positive momentum heading into the postseason. Yeah, I mean, I think Saturday was more. It was different than what it had looked like earlier in the week when they actually clicked a little bit. They had the one two goal game, right? So, I think the elements are looking better, but the zone entry, and again, maybe. It, Sleepy afternoon game, maybe. I'd be willing to give them a benefit of the doubt, but they had trouble entering the zone, Huss. And I mean, this is very, this is not complex. If you can't get in the zone, you're not going to get into your structure. <laughs> if, if you can't have a clean zone entry or dump it in, cross-ice dump, and chase it down, you're going to have trouble scoring on the power play. So 
again, the other night they, they, they score with 10 seconds left in the second minor. I didn't think their 5-on-3 was particularly dangerous. The game in Minnesota, they weren't dangerous at all. I, they, I, they didn't really even get set up, really, completely. Maybe the one time, but um, far too many times. Zone entry broken up, goes back down the other way. You saw a little bit of a, you know, frustration maybe kicking in a little bit. But uh, I would say that since Gabriel Velarde's back, the power play has looked much better. It's opening up the lane for Sean Monaghan. Mark Scheifele is dangerous. Josh Morrissey also. And Kyle Connor's one-timer will be available more with Velarde in the lineup than it was previously. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it needs to operate at a ridiculous clip, but it's going to need to be better than it has been over the course of the year. But, I mean, we know that when velarde has been on the power play, it's substantially better, and it's better for all parties on the ice. It just opens up more. And I think one of the things that I, the, from the, maybe it was the, I can't remember if it was against the Flames or the Wild, Josh is looking for his shot a little bit more too. And, and when you can get that traffic, uh, that gives it another component that maybe hasn't always been there this year when the... You know what? I know what you're talking about. You're talking the about the Flames. I yeah, mean, sorry, they had that thing, team. and I mean, they were not waiting. He wasn't waiting. Totally. He was getting in. They're obviously five on three as well. You know you got a better chance to get on rebounds, but there seemed to be a little bit more of urgency that sometimes has been missing from the Jets' power play. Yeah, for sure. And, and the one thing, I don't think it is as static as it was earlier in the year. When it's at its best, people are moving around. I mean, I love the way that Velarde handles himself down low, looks for his own shot. Um, you know, also looks when he when he takes it to the net, he also opens up either high slot, back door. There's there's just a a realm of possibilities that opens up that weren't happening before when Velarde was missing for those 15 games. Us, so I would say, with the exception of Saturday, it, it has been trending upward. But it needs to consistently, it doesn't have to score to every game, but it must provide the momentum required because you know that after that, after the power play ends, Lowry is coming over the boards with Appleton and Morgan Barron on a lot of levels. And after a, a momentum-filled power play, those guys can generate an offensive zone cycling shift. And then all of a sudden the team's been in their own end for, you know, three minutes or or something along those lines, and that sort of softens them up for the next turn, right? Whether that's the fourth line, well, it wouldn't be the fourth line because Barron's out there. That's when you get, you know, Shifley and Monaghan's lines kind of taking advantage of a tired line. And quite frankly, that's kind of what they did in 2018 when they had all those long cycle shifts and ability to turn games around. Now, again, we're not trying to get in the hot tub time machine, and we know Dustin Bufflin <laughs> is not coming through that tunnel like The Undertaker did on Sunday, Huss. <laughs> but they have that ability to churn things over, and that's something that they're going to need because we think that the Jets' forward depth is an area, along with goaltending, that would be an area of strength and that can maybe give them a, a slight advantage in a pick em series. Now, Probably, even with the loss of Bowen Byram, I would say the Avalanche probably have an edge on defense, uh, especially because of McCarr. But, you know, then it's up to the Jets to sort of make their hay in other areas. And Huss, one of the areas they're going to have to win is the special teams battle if you want to win a, a coin flip series. Well, and, and you know what? I mean, we saw what the fourth line did. I'm I'm feeling an Adam Lowry game tonight. <laughs> I'm uh might be a little tease for our cool bet lines of what we're going to get there after it. Go. But um, listen, moving on, we're going to hear from Bones in just a second as to what he's looking uh, forward uh, for the final five games. I know you're looking forward to getting out to Dallas and in Colorado. Yeah, buddy. We'll look forward to uh, catching uh, all of it in the Winnipeg Free Press. Great stuff, buddy. Thanks again for yep. doing this. Thanks for having me. A great couple of days. Glad you could make it out here. And, uh, we know, we ran into a bunch of uh, podcast listeners in the last yeah. couple of days. Yeah. Uh, that that is always so awesome to see, and folks are, uh, and they've just made the space such a great place in terms of the community building, and it's great to connect with them um, in person. When we Ken was it. being mobbed by both Jet fans <laughs> and random bachelorette parties last night. It was quite the scene. It was quite the scene here in uh, in Music City. Uh, enjoy the uh, this one tonight. We'll catch up later. Thanks, us. Take care, my man. All right, good stuff with uh, with Ken Weeb. Now we are going to have Mike Morreale jump on, but. As I mentioned, do want to hear uh, a couple of the uh, the quotes from uh, from Bones Remo. If you want to get to it to number ten, um, this is just the focus 
on Rick Bonus and what he is looking for from his club in these final five games before the Stanley Cup playoffs begin? Well, there'd be a couple of things there. Uh, specialty teams. We want our specialty teams better start with that. And we just have to work and compete for 60 minutes. We didn't do that. Uh, it, was a, it wasn't, uh, yeah, it just wasn't consistent enough. So they're going to they're going to come at us like they did here. We're going to go at them. But we got to play harder for 60 minutes because re- regardless who it is tomorrow night, it's got nothing to do with it. It's getting ready for the playoffs. We got to play hard. We got to play the right way. And it's in Nashville. I get it. They beat us. I get it. That's all fine and dandy. But the focus has to be on, on us and getting our game ready to go. All right. There's bones in that, that, that clip that we talked about. And, Here's the other one, and this is about the top lines play as of late. I mean, I know we had plenty of conversations as to what the best look is. Here's what the coach has to say about uh, the recent play of the top line. They're not getting enough chances, and when they're 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 not burying them, so that'll come. But every night you got to have somebody step up differently, and that's how you win in the playoffs. It's not just going to be the first or second line; it's going to be your third and fourth lines. We go into Minnesota; our fourth line was just the game. Who knows going to who's going to win that game tomorrow? But we want them all to be going to the game with the attitude they're going to be difference makers. It's not going to happen every night, but every night somebody's got a big new has to step up and make the difference, and that's what happened in Minnesota. So so the, the, their turn will come with they have to step up and win us a game. So you're happy with their chances and everything they're doing? That we need to create more. Yeah, yeah. All right, there's Rick Bonus on uh, top line and the upcoming five games, beginning with this one tonight at Bridgestone Arena in Nashville, 7 o'clock puck drop between the Winnipeg Jets and the Nashville Predators. Um, in just a second, we are going to uh, talk about a, a massive bit of news involving our Winnipeg Sea Bears and the CEBL with Mike Morreale. This is before we bring Mike on. Got to thank the great folks at Princess Auto for their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Of course, Princess Auto is the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them, Panet Road, Portage Avenue West. You can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. And, of course, counting down the days to get out to Princess Auto Stadium and cheer on those Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Um, Shout out to our friends at Royal Sports. We are ready for the playoffs, folks. The whiteout is coming. Are you ready for the whiteout? Get your tickets. And, of course, get your whites, and there's no better place to get geared up for the playoffs than Royal Sports. Thousands of pieces of Jets merchandise and selection, unlike anywhere else, period, bottom line. And while you're getting ready for the playoffs, get ready for spring, soccer, baseball, softball, tennis, stock coming in by the day. Follow them on Instagram as well, at Royal Sports Pemina, for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And, hey, great time to get out with the gang tonight or this week with the Jets on the road. When you do that, no better place to do it than your local Boston pizza, ice cold schooners, world famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and more. Make it a BP night. Jets pick a player contest at most local locations as well. And if you are staying at home, you can always get the great taste of Boston pizza by ordering online at bostonpizza.com. All right. Huge news today. Announced today. We're, uh, you know, we've had a great time talking with some of the new members of the Sea Bears, uh, as far as for this season goes. But not just for the Sea Bears, the CBL making a big news, and uh, well, let's bring in the commish, Mike Morreale, to talk more about it. What's going on, Mike? Great to have you back on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, you got Beautiful. it. Beautiful. You got great. a nice view of the roof of uh, the ceiling of the airport, Winnipeg Airport. So it's, uh, it's, you're I, there. I'm not... We're up in the uh, upper bowl of Bridgestone Arena right now, getting ready for this one tonight between the uh, the Jets and the uh, and the Predators. Um, but but listen, I mean, you make you made the big announcement later on, but for our listeners that missed it, um, CEBL Championship Weekend coming to Winnipeg. Uh, fill us in. What does that mean for fans here in the Peg? Well, it's really exciting, both for fans and Winnipeg fans across the league to be able to experience kind of a little taste of what the Sea Bears can offer, but in a big, profound way. So championship weekend for us is is kind of the final four meets the Grey Cup. That really is kind of the genesis behind it. So it's 
obviously the games, it's the festival, it's the music, the art, the lifestyle, the culture, um, the concerts, it's all that stuff rolled into one to have a basically a, a weekend dedicated to basketball and basketball of all types. And, you know, the, what the community has done there in Winnipeg, just in a very short period of time, has really made this an easy decision uh, for the league to, to, you know, put our, uh, all go all in on, on Winnipeg in, in Championship Week in 2020. Um, you know, for folks that are not familiar, um, break it down. Um, how many teams are there? How many games are in it? And um, just the kind of the format of it before we talk about everything ancillary um, for that people can take part in. Well, as it as it exists right now, and it, obviously we're talking about 2025, so never never hold your breath because yeah. things move fast around here. But you know, typically, uh, in what it'll be historically, and what it'll be this year in Montreal in August, is a Final Four weekend with uh, semifinal games typically on the Friday, double header, and then the championship game on the Saturday, and then sandwiched around that are things like the the awards on on Wednesday night and the commissioner's breakfast and the festival and a concert series, uh, you know, some 3X, uh, free basketball, some legacy events, a little bit of programming for everybody, obviously geared towards the basketball fan, but really geared towards the fan that just enjoys everything about basketball, all that kind of fringe benefits uh, that it brings. And, and we're just really happy that, you know, Winnipeg has a very good history of hosting events and we're lucky that Jason Smith, the president of the Sea Bears, has been the one hosting a lot of those events, whether it's the Junos or Grey Cups over the years. So uh, it made our decision pretty easy. You know, um, you know it, it's funny you, you hear kind of, you know, basketball meets sort of the Grey Cup. Um, you know, how much do you lean on your background uh, from uh, the other sport to uh, try to shape what uh, certainly is hopefully going to be, um, you know, a momentum building event year over year over year for the CEBL? Right. A lot. Lot. As you have to remember, prior to the CPL and CBL coming on, on board in the last six years, there was one domestic pro league. That was the CFL. That's where you learned everything, bad, good, and otherwise. That's where the history was. That's where, you know, the, the, the trials and tribulations have taken place and the good and the bad and the otherwise. And, you know, I was fortunate to spend a, a long, long time as a player and then as an executive, and I kind of saw a well-rounded version. So really, you know, the CBL is born out of that in many respects except it's geared towards the basketball audience and not just the people in the stands, but even the, the people that play the game, providing an opportunity like I was provided just by being able to go to Iverwind Stadium, in my case, and watch the Tide Cats play when I was a young kid. It gave me that hope that maybe I can do that someday. So the, the CFL is a, is a ve very big part of it. And if you look across, you know, the CEBL and the CPL, you know, there's a lot of CFL people mixed up everywhere. I think, it, you know, the CFL has got a lot to be, uh, proud of for what they've been able to do and what's kind of spun out of the work they've done over the last 110 years. Um, as far as is, is, is the host team automatically in? Like, does that mean that the Sea Bears will be participating in that championship weekend? It typically it has been to date. Again, you know, as as we as this Things league goes, this is the, I can never commit, never say never, because I, I just know that in my position there's a lot of things that happen. But we will come out in the next several months to, for an update just on any potential changes that would or could take place. So we don't want to leave people with the end of misunderstanding of one thing over another. So rest assured, in the next couple of months, we'll we'll share whatever information we can. But uh, we've had success the way we've done it. If we choose to go in a different direction, we'll have equal success. I'm not I'm not worried about that. We'll do what we think is best for the league, what's best for the, the local team, and what's best for the fan base. And, um, you know, there, there's you got to keep moving in this situation. you got to make sure you, you, you look at all aspects of what you're doing from a business. But so far, we're very excited about what's taking place, not just in Winnipeg, but across the whole league. The uh, Mike Morreale is the commissioner of the CEBL joining us at Winnipeg Sports Talk announcing the 2025 championship weekend is coming to the peg. That's in 2025. First, we got to get to 2024. How uh, how are you feeling about the upcoming season, the momentum building around the league, especially here in Winnipeg after that magical first season? Yeah, I mean, I'll start in Winnipeg. I mean, what happened there last year was really, it was magical. There was a touch of magic there. And, and I know that, the team has worked really hard in the off season for that, not only for that magic to continue, but to to explode and get bigger and bigger. And they're well on their way. Um, so it, it was a, you know, even from my position going back to the very beginning, it was kind of that proof of concept that you see it live out in real life. Uh, you know, it's there for the home opener, and then to see the the playoff game was really, you know, surreal in many ways. But a lot of 
hard work went into it uh, to build the league, to build the team, and really the commitment by the fans and the community to, to come on board. So I'm not worried about the Winnipeg Sea Bears. I think they're in good hands. They're, they're moving in the right direction. It also helps that the league is moving in the right direction. I talk about change, and you know, we've, as you grow, you have lots of change, but this will be the first year we actually go back-to-back seasons with the same teams, same divisions. We're strengthened. There's there's better people, um, you know, we whether it's on the court, off the court, in the executive room, you know, we continue to grow, grow this brand because we want it to last uh, as long as the CFL has lasted, right? That's that's a legacy part of what we're trying to do here. In a lot of ways, I mean, the, the Sea Bears organization, the city of Winnipeg and Winnipeg fans sort of raised the bar. Uh, they did it over and over again, setting new records for attendance. Um, can that be a good thing for the rest of the league as well? I mean, uh, sort of leading the way and uh, hopefully seeing similar momentum in uh, many of your other member clubs? I think that's the beauty of our league is that everybody's proud and supportive of the success of Winnipeg and all of our teams have success. You know, maybe it doesn't result in 11,000 people because our, the venue only holds 5,000, but we're getting sellouts in, in many of our buildings. I think eight of the 10 teams at sellouts, nine of the 10 teams at sellouts last year. And we, I know that's going to continue going into this year. So it's not always apples to apples, but certainly, you know, we look at the product on the court, the product, um, if you're watching from an entertainment uh, perspective in the arena, and then, you know, what the product looks like when you're watching on TV or on your phone. So all those combine to, to be successful. And, and sometimes, you know, the, the pure numbers lead the way. But across the league, I think everybody's really excited about where the league is going and the investments they continue to make into their teams. Hey, Mike, uh, just before we go, and great to have you on the program, um, for folks that have heard about the Sea Bears that didn't get out there last year, uh, what's the message from the commissioner about this upcoming season and uh, to uh, folks to, to, to get out there and experience what uh, what we have going on here in Winnipeg? Well, I think, you know, if you, if you get a chance to take in a game, you're, you're going to walk into a world-class facility right off the bat and enter into what could arguably be an NBA style game. Like it's going to feel that high level, but it's also going to feel like a place where you're going to get to know and meet new people and, and some old people and, and kind of be able to to live out that fandom uh, collectively. So, you know, it's, it's going to start with a bang. I know it's going to be a big uh, home opener for them. Obviously they want to continue their winning ways. They had a great start to the season last year and got out the gates quick. I, I know the type of players they're bringing in this year. Um, the level of basketball we play is, is world-class. There's no doubt about it. We send guys to the NBA on a regular basis. So if you're into world-class basketball at a reasonable price in your own market, you know, downtown at a great venue with great entertainment, uh, it, it's worth picking up a ticket. And you buy it once, I, I kind of have a feeling you may return again. Well, and I think people are really excited. The uh, From the, the basketball operations department, I think has had a pretty darn good off-season with some of the ads and the guys that we've had on the show. Um, and it's not surprising. I mean, uh, I think any player that came to Winnipeg that experienced what was going on here in the city with the Sea Bears in their inaugural <laughs> season probably thought that you know, given their druthers be a pretty good uh, pretty good place to play mike listen we'll have to get you on uh, when we uh, kick the season off continued success good luck in 2024 and we are looking forward to seeing you and the rest of the CVL uh, in winnipeg for the championship weekend in uh, 2025 awesome thanks for all the support appreciate it there's mike moriali the commish of the cebl next month it gets going again season two of Winnipeg Sea Bears basketball in the uh, in the CEBL. We're going to talk Masters coming up in just a couple of minutes, but let's uh, take a quick look at the Cool Bet lines for tonight. We'll kind of talk some golf lines with Jeff Feinberg coming up. Um, but we got a busy, busy night tonight here in the uh, in the National Hockey League. Um, this Jets Predators game. At least when we did the lock shop was a straight up pick 'em. See where we're at right now with it. I'm just cruising this down, and uh, indeed, straight up pick 'em minus 108 on either side. Now we are going to have a WST parlay coming off our big win last Friday in the Calgary game. Don't believe it is up just yet, unless we've got it in the lock shop section or load more. Oh, there we are. You just have to press load more, and it's at the bottom. They had a few other things that are up there already. As I said, I've got a feeling that this is an Adam Lowry game tonight. Um, so we're going to take 
an Adam Lowry point and a Josh Morrissey point and the Jets to win. Plus 445 up right now in the Cool Bet exclusives. We also have a lock shot partner parlay. Avalanche and Lightning both to win in regulation in the Dallas Stars puck line. That is at plus 520 again in the Cool Bet exclusives. Uh, as far as those games go, great matchup in the East. Carolina at Boston. Uh, the Canes a slight minus 114 favorite. Uh, we've got the well, Wings Capitals. Huge game in that turtle race for the Eastern Conference playoffs. Wings minus 145 at home. Caps plus 123. Uh, the Panthers minus 240 favorites against the uh, Sens. Flyers have to have this one tonight. They're running out of time. Minus 147 for Philly on the road in Montreal. Uh, the Leafs, who uh, beat Pittsburgh last night in OT, are in Jersey to take on the Devils. Leafs minus 128 faves. Uh, the Rangers minus 127 against the New York Islanders. Islanders come into tonight holding down the third spot in the Met. Uh, one of those games from our parlay, the Lightning home to the Columbus Blue Jackets. Lightning a minus 318 money line favorite. Buffalo in at Dallas. Buffalo plus 195. Dallas minus 231. We mentioned the Jets and Preds are a pick em. Total is five and a half. And the Avalanche are at home to the Minnesota Wild. Colorado minus 198 favorites. Uh, battle of SoCal Kings and Ducks. The Kings minus 279 faves. And the Arizona Coyotes are in Seattle to take on the Kraken. Kraken minus 142. And, uh, oh, Flames in San Jose as well. A little bit of a uh, draft lottery bowl, if you will. Uh, minus 216 for Calgary, plus 180 for San Jose. Uh, Reem, while I, while I mentioned it, um, Arizona, more interesting details coming out of the desert revolving the future of the Coyotes in this potential new building that we've been hearing about in many different forms for, uh, well, basically 20 years. Yes. I don't know what we're going to do if this ever gets wrapped up, Huss. Uh, we don't. We can't talk about the Coyotes' uh, new arena or current arena, but it was you know last week they said they intend to bid on this piece of land that is up for auction. And you know when I hear bid on auction land, I just think of you know Happy Gilmore going to bid on his grandmother's house and try to get it back in an auction. Uh, he wasn't successful for that. Shooter McGavin uh, came in and was able to outbid him. Will there be a Shooter McGavin to outbid the Coyotes for this parcel of land? But it was the Scottsdale mayor who came yeah. out yesterday, Huss, and said, you know what, this project is not feasible. There's no infrastructure out there. Well, how are you going to do, do all these people? There's roads and sewage and drainage and all this stuff. There is, it sounds like this arena I don't know enough about. I'm trying to learn because we're all obsessed about the Coyotes arena. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I don't know if this is going to work and, you know, Frank Saravalli has kind of been on the anti coyotes propaganda of, that you want to call, call it that over the last bit. And, uh, someone was calling him out for this over and over again. Cause Frank posted, it was, uh, Ryan Smith who wants to bring a pro team to Ottawa. He put out a tweet saying, Hey, if we did bring a team, um, Utah, isn't it? He's the Salt Lake Yeah, guy. did I say Ottawa? I said, yeah. I'm in Utah. Uh, you know, they sound similar. They end in ah. Uh. Anyways, uh, <laughs> he said, if we were to bring a pro team to Utah, what should we call them? And Frey's like, wow, that's really interesting that a guy who wants to buy a team is putting out this, uh, <laughs> this tweet. And then what was, let me just find Frank's response to this guy. Uh, which I thought was interesting. Is that the guy he told to drink bleach? No, it wasn't that guy. And <laughs> I stand with Frank and him telling that guy uh, to drink bleach for his anti-Semitic comments. But um, what was what was the comment here? Oh, oh. Um, so Frank said, not entirely certain that June twenty-seven twenty-four will be the date to circle on the calendar to find out so i don't know what that means maybe frank's got some info but we're all paying attention here to the coyotes arena and what the future may hold i'm actually most concerned about the jets 
records. I think the, the Coyotes should give them back. The NHL should do that. I think I'm holding out hope yes. that that will happen. And all this, if they do get moved or if they do, you know, do some type of rebranding, wouldn't they want to celebrate their own history instead of acknowledging that Timu Solani is the Coyotes franchise record holder for rookie goals for? Anyways, Dale, I know Dale Howard here. Chuck up in the uh, Dale yeah. Howard Chuck up in the uh, in the rafters. They should be um, celebrating Radim Verbata for all that he did for the Coyotes <laughs> franchise. Um, listen, we are going to talk to Feinberg. Of course, we just finished up the Cool Bet lines for tonight. Go check the exclusives. Also, a great majors promo right now. Check it out on the promotions page. Um, if you do like to uh, sprinkle on golf, our next guest certainly would fall into that category. Um, I do want to thank our friends at Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, though, folks. Don't forget, booking is underway now well into the summer for Aikens Lake. Um, world-class fly-in fishing lodge where you can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg. Uh, and as great as the fishing is, which is absolutely world-class, the hospitality from the Turan family and the Aikens fam, that much better. Great corporate outing, um, family event, um, and, and, you know, listen, a lot of times people have been spending a lot of time, you know, on Zoom calls for a long time. I mean, there's nothing like getting out on the boat, on the water at somewhere like Aikens. Uh, find out more at AikensLake.com. Don't forget, any young fishing enthusiasts out there, throw a resume into Pitt. They're looking for a couple guides if you want to spend the summer in paradise and have a great time to do that. Um, and, of course, we've got golf to talk about it is masters week when we talk golf on this program we do it for the great gang over at breezy bend golf and country club cannot wait to get out of the course hopefully sooner as opposed to later um also a great spot for hosting events like weddings you can find out more on breezy over at breezybend.ca um let's bring in the man himself jeff feinberg it is masters week and uh, I know you're a card-carrying member of the Batia Boys. Everyone's fired up after that weekend. Dude, that that back nine took years off my life. And it wasn't like Akshay was not playing well. But Denny went absolutely nuclear with the 28 and then somehow chunked it into the water in the playoff. I mean, what a roller coaster that was. Hustler, at the end of the year, you'll like the whole golf season will be a blur. As it is for guys like you and me, when you bet it week in, week out, like, yeah, you have your moments, but outside of like majors and the big bets, it's just a blur. That one's going to live for, for a long time. Like what a crazy 90 minutes. And I got to tell you folks, I was being a proactive father. It is master's week. I'm going to abandon my family. There's a dude with a six stroke lead on the 11th hole on the PGA tour. It's time the weather's getting nice. It's time to proactively be a good dad, knowing that you're abandoning your family in the coming days for the Masters. I'm going to Vegas, you know, with, with the show. So we're going to have a blast. I had to, like, tap out, though, Huss. Like, the park time, we had to round up the crew from the park by the time it got to two strokes. I'm listening on the radio. Denny's hitting everything. He's chipping in, and you said it. Achke. He, he had a six-stroke lead, and he shot two under on the back. Do the math. Like, that's not a choke job. Like, how do you how do you even get in that position? But it was, it was wild. And to think that after hitting all those birdies, McCarthy could go full 17 handicap, you know, do something like me, chunk it into the water. <laughs> what a crazy, what a crazy experience. To topped only by the fact that all of a sudden the trainer needed to come out oh. and he left the course at that point. I mean, are, <laughs> it, did, yeah. it did not seem real. It layers. was Twilight Zone afternoon on tour. There were layers upon layers on how weird this thing got. And can you imagine, like, you just put it in the water. Buddy needs a timeout with a trainer. Get the pain over with. You know, like, he's now got a, like, wow, from 100 yards. But, hey, good whatever it's over now huss uh we bring a couple winners into masters week it's not been the greatest season for the outrights but been able to pull off a couple in a row here headed into the masters or you just gotta just you know you just almost accept your fate that scheffler's about to give us all a whip and i think well i mean let's get to that i mean we were uh, kind of going over the lines over at cool bed of this and i mean scotty scheffler is now down to plus 
four fifty. I mean, this is a number so short in a in a master's field, unlike anything we've seen since Prime Tiger twenty years ago. There's so many factors here. I mean, his C game competes. He's a past major champion. The course is almost perfect for him. His short game is immaculate to go with this ball striking. The other element here, Hustler, is that all the other good players in the world have not really been playing well. You know, and Rory's got these questions. Rom, you could argue Rom's a sleeping giant, but he didn't win on live this year. And for how great he is, he should have. When Brooks came second last year, he won twice in live on the lead up in both in Jetta and the week before. Um, you know, the guy, you know, Victor Hovland is straight Don Houdini, which is so sad. I got a lot of great futures, but got to own the ones that are worth less today than when I placed them. That would be one of them. Uh, you know, and the, the, the most competent players on tour seem like, uh, you know, Wyndham Clark, Ludwig Eberg, who are debutants, and then you obviously have Xander Shoffley and Hideki Matsuyama, who many feel could be the most, uh, the, give Scotty the biggest threat. Scotty doesn't have many threats out there. That's part of the problem with this line. No, uh, that, I mean, it, <laughs> plus 450, you just keep looking at it. It just does not but seem real. You know what, though, Huss? I think the casuals are all in. Because when it comes to college basketball, I'm a casual. I'll give myself a little pat on the back. I don't know anything. Didn't watch a game all season. What did I do? I listened to that UConn. hype about UConn. I bet them plus 400 to win the tournament. I bet you there's college basketball hardos who are like us, like a full card of like guy, bigger odd teams. Uh, they'll they'll meet their maker in this thing. No, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. And in the end, it was us, you know, it was us, you know, guys who took the bait with that super chalk. Didn't really know a ton, but we all had great, a great little bet. So, I, I, and I think a lot of non-hardcore golf fans, casuals, will sort of take the same approach that I took with why I bet UConn knowing nothing to taking Scheffler here. Well, us guys who do this week in and week out are like, we just can't do that. We're back next week betting the Heritage, guys like you and me, us. Well, and, and you know the funny thing was, I mean, I, uh, I we had a parlay that. Um, we had two of the games in. This is about a month ago or so, right before the players. And I said, I said to myself, if Florida comes back and beats Dallas to cash this thing, I'm putting the entire thing on Scotty Scheffler to win the players at like plus five seventy five or whatever the number was. And because that's just a number that we would normally not. It's just too short. Like too many other things that can happen. And yet there he was, um, you know, on Sunday, coming back, making up the ground and winning. I mean, it really does feel like it's his to lose. But there are a couple of other guys, and you just named them. I did get somewhat fortunate uh, because I was going to be down here in Nashville. I wasn't sure whether I was going to be able to actually use my app. So Friday night, I felt like I kind of had to make master's bets in case I couldn't get in. Um, well, the Xander number has gone from 20 to 16. And the Hideki that I got on Friday at 33 Ooh, yeah. has now gone to 22. He looked Great good work. on the weekend. Let's talk about those two guys in particular, um, how they're looking right now and why a lot of people think that they're the biggest threats to Scotty Scheffler and Augusta. I mean, by the numbers, they are the biggest threats, in my opinion. But you could argue like numbers don't mean anything. It's a major championship. You just need guys with like the guts and the stones. We obviously know Hideki's got it. Xander's got those questions. But I'm an apologist for so many guys that haven't won big events at times, Hustler, that the moment Xander Shoffley breaks this through, all those second places are going to be used to, like, lift him up. When you argue, once Xander Shoffley wins his big event, all those previous close calls are going to be used to, like, lift up your argument of Xander Shoffley. I think it takes a lot of guts to bet Xander Shoffley and like not bet Brooks Kepka. You know what I mean? Like one guy just always wins, one guy never wins, but no one has been more consistent than Xander Shoffley. I personally feel like he's kind of ready for this. Um, I, I bet Xander as well with an early number into the 20s. I bet it during that players' championship when I thought he was going to win. Truth be told, I had him to win that week and it was. Second again with Xander. I did joke, though, Huss. Josh Allen was asked recently if he's worried about CTE. And he was quoted saying, I know what I signed up for. Us Xander Shoffley backers have to almost take the same approach as like <laughs> football players who have, who have accepted their CTE. 
Like, we know what we've signed up for. You don't need to ridicule us. Um, but yeah, we're in on it. And as for Hideki, I mean, the ball striking has just been eye popping. He seems so comfortable around the greens right now. He's driving it so good. I, I really do love Hideki. If I wasn't sort of preloaded with so many futures, I probably would have bet Hideki this week for sure, I think. Um, uh, outside of that, I mean, uh, any uh, kind of bombs that you're uh, throwing in uh, just to uh, round out the card at bigger numbers? There's a whole range of, since we've sort of become friends, Huss, the Masters winners have been broken into almost two distinct ranges. The very top where we've had our Schefflers and our, our DJs and our ROMs. And then literally it, that second tier of guys we want to trust haven't been the ones to trust. It's been that like 40 to 60 to one tier. That's where you saw Sergio and Reed and Hideki and even Will it by week of was like 66 to one. That's been a profitable tier. And there are a lot of guys in that range that I know, be it, be it our guy, Tony Fee now, if you could trust him to make six footers. Um, it's a perfect course for Cam Young. It's a big ask because he's never won a major tournament, but I will say it's a perfect course for him. I will definitely be betting him like top tens and such. And I know you're on it. I managed to find myself a 60 to one. I know you pulled the 66 because we were chatting about it. The hit the gala. The guy almost does everything that we love about Jordan Spieth and Cam Smith, but he also brings high level driving in driving of the golf ball into the equation in a way those two players never could. A friend of mine who I really respect in golf at the beginning of the year, he made the comparison that like where you would like Spieth, you need to like the gala. And that has honestly shown itself all through this golf season from go. All like the places that seem to work for Spieth also seem to work for Sahith. You could question his around the green game, but he was ninth here last year. And as we know, as golf fans, some places guys can just be comfortable around the green. This seems to be it for him. It does seem like a huge ask. You'd almost want more than the bigger numbers that we're getting, but it would be sort of those sorts of guys, Cam Young, Tony Finau, Sahit Tagala, that um, if I were making bets right now, it would be them who I was staring at. Although, Huss, as we've gotten deeper into the week, we are seeing like huge rise in a lot of guys you like want to feel you want to trust, be it like a Homa, a Morikawa, a Patrick Cantley, numbers flirting with 50 to one. But you find, can you find your game at Augusta? Like, do you trust someone to actually find themselves at Augusta? Because I don't know we've ever seen someone find their game at Augusta en route to a win. You pretty much need to show up with it. Um, uh, any uh, interest in any of the live guys? And uh, if you had to bet top live player at this event, who's getting your scratch? So I I have a big Joachim Neiman ticket at a big number, like before he was even in the Masters. So that would be my fingers crossed. But if I got to pick a different guy, like from the pack, Patty Reed, playing decent enough where I want to trust him. Uh, I don't know that I'd actually bet him to win outright, but it would be. It would be Patrick Reed. He is the man. So uh, you mentioned the voice heading to Vegas. Uh, fill people in on uh, what you and the fellas have going on. You going to be uh, doing the show and watching the game from the tub in the uh, Circus Swim on the weekend? Yeah, so apparently that's a bit of a plan, huh? So Circus Swim action. Uh, we'll be going in Wednesday night. I know Mayo will be doing like a final thoughts show tomorrow night. I'm sure I'll be stepping in with him. Uh, I think every day, like sort of after the golf, we'll be doing something Friday. Obviously, we'll be doing a cut sweat. I think Saturday we'll be doing it from from Stadium Swim over at Circa. So should be a good time. I'm real fired up. Hustlers. It's Masters Week. There's so many things to love about this, like even just to like look at it from top debutant or something. And I'll also give one final tip in Canada, you have access to the each ways. You might honestly get, I will be with Scheffler at four or five to one. Maybe for some golf fans, the strategy should be picking those guys at like 150 to one, 200 to one and getting your places. If you catch a guy with like eight to 10 places, that's going to pay almost three times as much as the Scotty Scheffler win ticket. And it's great to like pick the winner, but truth of the matter is there's really a lot of places you can try to find something 
on this uh, on this board. If I had to pick a couple, it'd be Taylor Moore and Steven Yeager. Cam Davis there. I added in a third. Deep, Dude, deep. Uh, Guys, deep, Haas. Uh, We're talking is, deep at the board. Is is uh, is Tim uh, as part of the crew that's uh, going to be uh, in, a, in a full effect? You know, I wish. I really wish. Tim, Vegas goes against a lot of like Tim's morals, Haas. Well, so uh, does Liv, and he's apparently the biggest yeah. Liv guy around. So I don't I mean, know what's uh, up he, with he, that. That's, he never that, ceases to amaze us. Never ceases to amaze. No, unfortunately, this is one that uh, I don't believe he's getting to be a part of. But we've been talking on the back end, Huss. We're bringing the show on another road trip later, end of summer, in Montreal for the President's Cup. Oh, Tim yeah. Will, Tim will be there. I, I got a good feeling I'm going to see you there, too. I'll be bugging you about it all summer, buddy. I cannot wait. I cannot wait for that. Uh, listen, really looking forward to seeing what you and the uh, fellas have going on. Check it all out at Mayo Media Network. Uh, give the boys a sub on YouTube. Have a good time. Good luck with the picks. And uh, we'll look forward to catching up uh, for for a recap when uh, you guys get your act together and get back on home soil after the weekend. All the best, Hosco Jets. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. There it is, our my pal Jeff Feinberg at G Feinberg seventeen. And again, uh, all of the uh, golf content with Jeff and Pat over at Mayo Media Network. Um, and again, I did put this out yesterday. I think if you check my feed, I'm gonna go back to my uh, my Twitter feed. Um, yesterday afternoon, I believe I put it out. Very, very cool. Um, majors campaign for um, uh, over at Cool Bet. You earn points when you win bets on all four golf majors. Um, apply the quote major contest bet before confirming your wager. Um, you'll be in for some great prizes available from our friends over at Cool Bet. Uh, odds are up there. And tomorrow we will kind of do what we just did with Feinberg, but take it to the whole next level. The One of the biggest lock shop shows of the year, the Masters special tomorrow at noon, Edmonton Sports Talk on a heater after hitting that 50 to 1 um, Akshay last week. The accounts are flush and uh, we'll be firing tomorrow. So if you do like that. Oh, and by the way, uh, Remote, I'm just checking right now. Do we got uh, room still in the uh, in the um, DraftKings contest for the Masters? Yeah, there's a couple spots open. Perfect. Uh, link in the description. Link in the description, gang. Check it out and uh, play with us. It should be a heck of a lot of fun. All right, before we go, Remo, back in here. What, uh, what what's your feeling for this one tonight? Yeah, I think the Jets get it. I think um, they take exception us to the beatdown. Uh, from a couple weeks ago, I think that maybe they're a little mad that you know they had to go back to Winnipeg after Minnesota and couldn't spend that extra day in Nashville. I think it's going to pay off, uh, and I, I'm expecting a solid game here uh, for the Jets' three-game win streak. Look to make it four tonight. So I, you know, it's a tough one. I mean, flip a coin, us, because that's what the uh, cool bet odds say. It is a pick 'em, but uh, I think I like like the Jets here. Yeah, well, as I said, if you want to jump on that uh, that WST exclusive that we put together, a Lowry point, Morrissey point, Jets to win, plus 445. Uh, that's going to do it for us. We're going to get this pot up so people can check the show out before puck drop tonight. Um, I will be back tomorrow from Nashville. Uh, we've got lots coming up, including Colby Barlow on the show tomorrow. He, of course, has been uh, assigned to the Manitoba Moose. Looking forward to catching up with him. Uh, full recap of tonight's action and a look ahead to the next stop on the road trip in Dallas. But tonight, the main event is Jets Preds just after 7 o'clock here in Music City. Uh, big thanks to Michael Remus for uh, doing a heck of a job getting us uh, through this one today. Thanks to uh, Max Hers. Fun to have him join me live. And, of course, Ken Weeb. Mike Morreale, as well as Jeff Feinberg. Big thanks to all the sponsors that make the show happen each and every day. Folks, enjoy the game tonight. We'll see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. live from Nashville. The Jets wheels up to Dallas after tonight's tilt. Enjoy it tonight, and we will see you tomorrow on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.